clean my windows, you might say. Well, yes and no. You can see they're made from some leftover mm, double glazed units. So uh, there's probably condensation inside of them because they're salvaged and made into this temporary office. Anyway, hello, welcome to Relapse Guitars. And um, look, there's the fretting bench waiting for one neck to be fretted. But over here, we're waiting for another one. And this is what this video is about. This is um, this is Dave's, what's it, Hondo 2 from, I think, around about 1980, something like that. Um, and you can see, just straight in with the close-ups, you can see that lovely old Hondo look. This is, um, this is the finish has shrunken so much that the plastic has kind of become transparent and you can see the glue blo blobs underneath. Um, so this is one of those classic old, what I call plywood horrors. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way. You might think I do. <coughs> I mean it in a sort of a reverential sort of way in that, you know, these are the guitars that we grew up with, some of us oldies. So it's a, it's a bolt-on Les Paul copy, which is old, you know, it's got plenty of mojo because it's been around and lived. Basically, it's made out of plywood, made in Japan somewhere. I don't know what this, um, shouldn't put the name on this one, but normally had a made in Japan sticker on them. Um, sorry, engraving, printed. Stamped is the word. Uh, and you can see the finishes gone through here and lots of wear and tear. Um, double white binding, which is cracked and got loads of character to it. You can see that splitting kind of stuff that you have to be <laughs> very careful of because it falls apart on you. Yeah. Um, you can hear the, probably hear the sheep at my window. There's a bit of dinging going on here, which is quite a dent. Um, and these lovely cheap old slim tuners, <coughs> or slim little buttons they had on there. Very, very uh, unusual. Well, they were usual for these, but they're very unusual to find anything like that now. So this is a, a very good example of the kind of guitar that um, I like to work on. And some people will say such things as, "What well, you know, when somebody brings a guitar like this to me, why, why don't you tell them straight away not to spend any money on it? Um, it's just, you know, when people bring me a guitar like this, they usually bring it not because they think it's worth a load of money or it's going to be a collector's item or whatever. They bring it because it means a lot to them. It's very often um, quite likely to be the first ever guitar they had. <coughs> and as a result, you know, maybe it's come down out of the attic finally after all those years um, out of the way. Oh, by the way, new camera angle up there. <coughs> Excuse me. New camera angle. Uh, I just thought I'd change, take a change from having one there. So we'll do two sides. Um, this one's good for the close-ups for nut stuff. And this is a good cutaway for when I'm down here. And of course, should I want to do something down there, I can kind of zoom in like that. But since it's a bit of more of a wide angle, it's still not a bad view to have, I reckon. Right. We've got cracked plastics and stuff. So, okay, so this is a, a really nice example of a, a much-loved old guitar. And I call them plywood horrors because when, when they were made, they were sort of sold in the Woolies, Woolworths store um, on the little stand with maybe a satellite guitar um, and a Bon Tempe organ or something like that. They really, either that or in catalogues, they weren't high quality instruments, um, but you can make them play. I mean, they're great fun to play because they're so mojo-y and old style-y, um, but they take, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna keep them going forever and you want them to improve, then you have to do, um, usually take these very old necks and refret them because the frets are both worn and pitted. So I always say to a customer who brings one of these, no matter what you spend on this, it will never be worth a fraction of that. 
because it's only ever a Hondo 2. And to anyone, there's a lot of would-be chancers who like to say, you know, oh, made in Japan quality, this is as good as a Gibson Les Paul. Well, it's pretty heavy, but it's not as good as a Gibson Les Paul. It's, the pickups were pretty dire quality. The hardware's rubbish quality. The pots are little tiny ones, usually. Um, it's all plywood under here. Uh, the neck is buzzy and thrummy, if you listen to... Truss rod is rattling away like crazy, even though I tightened it up to test whether it was working. So, you know, there's, there's kind of, it's not a brilliant guitar to begin with. But the point is, it, people bring these because they love them and they want me to do something with them to make them play better than they ever have before. And I can certainly do that, but you have to invest in, well, no, invest isn't the right word. You have to spend money on getting the neck done. So I'll refret the neck with some lovely new fret wire sitting up here. It was medium jumbo it's on the sort of vintage side. It's more, it's pretty close to this dimension actually, but taller. Um, I'm going to refret this. We're going to fit an adjustable nut so it stays in tune. We're going to put new pickups in. Only, um, you know, reasonable budget ones, Wilkinson hot, hot, not hot ones. Um, we'll have a roller bridge and we'll keep the original stop bar. We'll have new pots and new wiring throughout, a new switch. And we'll keep the original tuners because I know that the tuning stability is not in the tuners, it's in the nut and it's in the slack in the strings. So I'm just going to take this little thing completely to pieces. So this is uh, Dave's guitar and this is the start of the, the refurb project. And tonight I'm going to go over there and um, once I've pulled the frets, I'm going to, uh, well, I'm going to take it into the other place, re-radius the uh, board and then probably uh, hopefully refret it tonight with another one I've got over there and then leave that to um, do the fret and <coughs> excuse me ends and stuff later on so that'll be the first stage of this but from this point of view this is called what's in a 1980s Les Paul guitar so like I said the anyone who claims these are Gibson star quality is is just it's nonsense they really aren't and you'll see why in a minute because they are just plywood um, but, like I said, they were, in the days when I was starting to play, you couldn't get an awful lot better at the time without spending a lot more money. So for most kids starting out and playing guitar, this was it. This was what we had. I, I had a satellite strat style, and I wish, in some ways, looking back on it, I wish to goodness I'd had one of these, because at least this was a full-size guitar, little, little known to, unbeknownst to me. The, um, the strap was a three-quarter size one, and I had no idea. How would you know if you're just a teen, you know, teenager at, in sixth form at school? So I bought that through my, um, my, my, mate, my schoolmate's mum's catalogue. She very kindly did what my dad wouldn't do. Bugger. Um, she helped me to buy it. Um, I'm not quite sure what his take on it was. I think I might have, to have gone down the salt mines for 10 years first to earn it but she introduced me to the good old-fashioned idea of buying it on the tick or whatever they call it um which was great because i paid it back nothing you know i certainly wouldn't let a friend's mum down um and uh yeah that um that turned up in a cardboard box at the time and uh, we were all sort of raring to play in this sort of punkish new wave-ish sort of band and uh <clears throat> yeah, it turned up in three quarter size. It was like a toy, so that was a bit of a horrific surprise, <laughs> an uh, unexpected and unwelcome surprise, I may add. Right. So let's get back to these th these electric guitar constructions. So, what is it made of? Well, the first bit that's gone in the bin is the stop bar. Look how crude that is. I mean, just ground down with some sort of tool in the factory shoved on. That holds the strings in place and underneath that, looky looky, we've got, when the strings are off, we can have a good close-up look at the fretboard and you can see now it's, um, this guitar in a sense hasn't been massively overplayed because it hasn't got too much of the pitting. It has a little bit, sort of, what I mean by that, the sort of sunken little troughs here, which are the signs of teenage finger goo. Um, blimey, me, these are falling out so these need sticking back down as well before we do too much to it <coughs> they really want to come out so we'll put some glue in there yeah these are literally there you go hello 
ready to be glued back in. So we'll take care of that. Um, right. Um, so, of course, one of the things about these guitars is they're bolt-on necks. Now, a lot of people will say things like, oh, that's, um, that's terrible quality, isn't it, bolt-on neck? Because there's a myth, a sort of mythology out there about people who say that glued necks or set necks, there goes the bridge, by the way, oh, all the little pieces are loose where they can go in the bin. So that, amazing how um, they've ever kept these in one place. They're all, they've got nothing holding them down. Um, yeah, so there's a, a kind of mythology about the uh, set neck, glued neck guitar being so much better than the um, bolted on neck. But actually, I've played as, you know, as many glued necks as I have bolted neck guitars, and they're all great in their own way. Um, so there are some fab fabulous old-fashioned style um, uh, bolted-on neck guitars from this sort of era. There are some, you know, inexpensive ones like this, you know, for the learner player. Um, and then, you know, yes, it's true that the Gibson always has a a set neck, and the uh, the idea was, or people like to think that somehow that transfers more, better, more tone to the amplifier, but. It's hard to, well, to put it this way, I've never seen a convincing or heard even the beginnings of a convincing argument, apart from people giving you sort of 10,000 page long scientific papers that some nerd has written in the past, which is so complex, you have to take someone's word for it that it's an argument stating why bolted necks are better, uh, sorry, to, um, glued necks are better, but actually I think by the time you take it apart, you find that isn't what the paper's saying anyway. Um, but the, the, I think the misunderstanding is somehow the tone flows through the guitar wood down to the pickups and does some amazing thing. Well, it doesn't. All that, there you go, there's a shim, classic piece of paper. All that really happens is that your neck and body need to be a solid joint so that no string energy is wasted in shaking the neck and the body joint around. So there goes the neck bolts a bit, a bit on the rusty side but nothing <coughs> nothing damaged or nothing likely to break so that that neck had or that heel neck heel had a what's called a shim under there which is made from a cigarette piece of cigarette craven a i would recommend for all you good pub guitarists smoking your craven a's um i'll put that in here because that's quite a, i wonder if that was dave's favorite cigarette in the day so that was there just to push up the back end of the neck a little bit more to make it play better. And we can use something else or we can replace that when the time comes, should we need it. Um, oh, God, what a mess. Right, let's have a, let's get the close-ups. Oh, my God, this is a mess. Holy moly. God, that is an absolute stink mess. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's going to be one of those guitars that turns into a a nightmare when you start looking under there. Look at that. Ew, that's something else. That needs to be flat and even. And if you kind of fly down here with me, come fly with me, you'll probably start to sense that this is not really even. And if we get right down, you see that's probably a hole at the back there. It's dug into a hole. So maybe the Craven A filled that hole a bit. I don't know. But it's a mess. So uh, I'm going to need to figure something out to sort that out. I have a, I have a cure for this. It involves using um, resin. And we can let the resin set to a level and fill in these troughs. Or we can, you know, the worst comes to the worst, you can put in an insert and then reroute it. But that's not really the best idea here. You can also see what I was saying is that this whole thing is made of um, plywood. Um, you can see the plywood layers there. And of course you can see them right at the back as well, if you can focus. Um, and there's a sort of, usually a gap 
there you can see a little open opening between the top which is a molded curved bit and the bottom which is flat layers of ply so it's a <coughs> yeah, it's a bit of a, a ghastly construction but it does the job you know that's that's what it was all about about looking and playing like a guitar so let's let's not get too snotting snotting so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off everything um, I don't find, find the right tools I'm going to take off the strap buttons off the end see they're all a bit loose to begin with so it'd be nice to be able to um, tighten those back up or make sure or put a new screw in this screw is bent because it's been banged off it it's also a large screw so somebody when ha what happens is the very often the plywood um, gets sort of ma mashed up after many years so this thing eventually won't stay in place so people tend to fit larger and larger uh, screws to hold things in place so we can um, find something even larger or we can fill the hole and give it something to grip into so that's quite easy to do with a bit of dowel or something like that so I'm going to take everything off because that's what I do when I remake something like this oh there it goes uh, the uh, felt that sits there um, and I suppose taking it all off is a way of, of finding out what's what and how things look um, it can also be also be a bit of a, a shock to f find out fatal flaws with it um, you know when I do something like this the first thing I'll do is is make sure that the truss rod is working because if you're going to refret it you want to be able to adjust the truss rod and get the amount of curvature in the neck that you want. The purpose of the truss rod is to adjust or to control the curve in the guitar's neck. Nothing else. It's not about changing the action on your guitar as some people think. So there you go. These are a bit worn out so it's time to replace those screws. Um, yeah so first test really is to make sure the truss rod works otherwise we we could go to the lengths of putting nice new frets on it, making the neck look and feel like new, but we don't have any control over it and it might end up with too much or too little of a bend in it, which can you know, substantially affect the way it feels to play. So, like I say, critical to make sure the truss rod works. Um, in this case, it works reasonably well. It's a bit worn out. Ew, let's have a fly, fly in. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, wow, Chinese, horrible. Sorry, Japanese, 1980, 79. Uh, two volumes, two tones, two capacitors, some very scrawny wiring and very stiff wiring. There it is. Oops, sorry. Um, sort of, not really any much of attempt to shield it or anything. Um, Wow, it's quite good to see inside something like this that's just ancient. It's all those teenage years of s angst and suffering and important stuff that we all go through, all summed up in one shaggy um, plywood package, baby. Uh, let's try and get this somewhat right. So, I mean, I'll take it all apart now because that's what I like to do, but the next... The, the next step tonight in terms of work is to um, is to uh, do the fretting part so we'll, we'll replace we'll replace a lot of this like for example we'll replace the jack socket um, put a new one on just make sure everything works as good as it can we should be able to use full-size pots in here um, it may just be a tight squeeze in one of these cutouts but we shall see I've ordered full-size anyway um, and if it doesn't fit straight off we can always um, you know make a, a kind of physical adjustment to make it fit nice to have you know full-size hardware um, now here's a here's an interesting reason why this doesn't work very well um, Let's have a look at this close up. See that? No, it's too much too busy focusing on everything else. That's the uh, 
come on. Sorry, it's a bit naff game, let's just focus. Right, so we've got the two lugs, the ground lug and the live lug, are pulled round together, and they're practically touching, so they probably are shorting out on each other here, and they're twisted round. So it shows that, amongst other things, it's also... But f there you go, that last strand broke. So the two lugs are in the right in line with each other, ready to touch out, and also the wires are wrapped round in a sort of tied up like that. And that just kind of shows that this thing's been tightened up and gone round in circles a few times in its life, um, which all, which is the sort of fate that um, just about all uh, all jack sockets and knobs on old guitars kind of experience because they they usually end up spinning um, and it, you, you'll see it straight away when you you know when you come to take knobs off um, you can you can see the coiled wires so off come the knobs well I suppose on a plus side I take these off and there's no massive cracks or anything, which is nice. I don't want to do that and find there's a, a huge broken top. Um, so these are, yeah, these are spinning round. I'm going to loosen these nuts off and we shall take all these bits out. So yeah, pretty simple really. Not a lot of, nothing high tech at all. I mean, not even in a in a modern day Gibson, there's nothing, well, maybe in a couple of the models nowadays, but in the sort of standard stuff, it's all very 1940s technology, 50s at, at best. A couple of a little add-ons in later years, but. So I'm just gonna pull up all of this stuff and just for fun, I'm going to snip that. That's the ground wire which we want to keep. That grounds the bridge. And I'm going to snip pretty much everything else at its end. Well, that one's broken off, whatever that was attached to, so that's not so good. Now I'm going to rewire it slightly different from this when the time comes. We have got a pile of washers that were used to sort of stack out the um, pots, make them sit in the right place, I think. Okay, so that's all the those components out. And now I'm just going to undo oh, this one's a sort of reg regular nut, which I can't quite reach with this, but it'll do. There we go. Just needs loosening. Take that off. I've got another switch coming toggle switch so we can start fresh but we'll keep this off to one side just in case and then we have the, the little sticker for the uh, treble rhythm and treble sign on it and then we can pull all that through that way that's the original stuff the next thing is time to get out the pickups so very soon Everything except for the uh, bushings, if you like, the hold, the bridge posts and the stop bar posts, everything but those will be out. But it means I can have a, a good un, unhindered look at fixing this problem here because that's, that's, that's making a big air gap. There's a great big step down on that. It shouldn't be there. So it's something's, something's chiseled in there. Somebody's chiseled in there and made a bit of a, a mess of it in the past. I'm not saying you, Dave, but some some exuberant teenager has. Okay. Okay. These these are sort of yeah. These these might be humbuckers. In fact, sometimes in the old in some of the old guitars they were actually single coils pretending to be humbuckers. So I think what's happened here is we've got a slope and then it's kind of leveled off somewhere in the middle. It, f it feels like there's a plateau right here. Um, and 
I think by the looks of it, the neck probably sits up at, at the back on this back shelf, and then there is more than likely an air gap. Oh God, that's terrible. Yikes. Will you look at that? So running off the front edge, the solid front edge there. That's a, a mess. So we can shim it, um, but we, we then fill it with resin and, and it will un, underfill or infill underneath the heel. Um, we'll cover the heel with some polythene or something and that heel will, um, will make the... Uh, set the level if you like so there we have it the body in all its plywood glory and you can see um it is plywood some guitars even i mean there's so much stuff in here that the route it's been routed that's one thing some of these chinese well, japanese some old guitars aren't even routed they're just hand drilled or hand routed but this has been done with a at least with a template um the ply is split here it's not the end of the world it doesn't there's no loading it doesn't do anything um, but there's a split but you know it's no reason at all why this won't set up with some nice new pickups and a newly revamped neck so what I'm going to do is just going to find me a bit of wire or a para paraglider no parachute no paracord like this and I shall hang this up in the safety of the spare room while I work out what to do with it. Spare room? The store cupboard. And then we'll look in detail at the neck. So hang that up out of the way and that will be it. So that was the dismantling of a 1980s Les Paul, plywood Les Paul, made by Hondo. Um, um, of course, a good thing about this microphone is you can hear me out here. Now the Hondo neck, um, as I mentioned, no, I haven't mentioned, but Hondo neck, I really, really like. It's a really good quality neck. So um, I'm just bringing something else out for a second. So I, I think there's a lot of promise for the Hondo neck. Um, although, you know, this is battered and bruised. So we're going to take off the tuners and everything from here. So stand by for a bit of the old screwdriver noise. And we're just going to drop everything in there. Now, like I said, um, I felt that the truss rod <coughs> was lacking a bit of bite. It did work, but not brilliantly. So what I'm going <coughs> to, excuse me, what I proposed to do, look how, how inexpensive these tuners are. They sort of fall apart, and that's all they are inside there, just pressed metal. Um, there you go. What was I saying? Oh yeah, truss rod. Um, I felt that it was not biting as much as we might want. So I found and I've kept a tiny washer that we can uh, use. And if it works, this doesn't always work, but if, if we can, we can add this washer into the end of the truss rod, if we can. Uh, and it can sometimes give it a little bit of extra bite because um, it has something more to push on to. I, I don't really know how or why that should work, but it has seemed to do in the past. Oh yeah, this had split off before and broken, so... Um, but it's been glued back on and it's fine. It's, it's not very straight <coughs> and there's a big lip in the finish, but, you know, it's part of the character and I know that it's you know it's part of the history that Dave likes it for so <clears throat> I'm not going to try and fix our way out of that although you know it wouldn't be too difficult to fill and sand back and respray all of this stuff for fun if that's what we wanted to do okay so some of these um, some of these ferrules like to come out on their own um, and some just don't <laughs> Most of them are. Thank you. Okay, so that's uh, now we we'll take the truss rod cover off. Again, these little screws are pretty worn out, so they're not really biting anything at this point. 
um, if we wanted to use these tiny screws again we would probably need to fill and redrill the pilot hole so fill with a little bit of dowel and um, where did it go that was amazing One of these just just went for a walk without any noise at all. One minute it was in in there, next minute it's gone. Oh, there it is, blimey! Just like that. Okay, let's take this off now. Here's the fun bit. We're going to take off the brass nut. Now, the reason I suggested taking off this brass nut is because it's badly fitted, but also because what I want for Dave on this guitar is I want it to be stay in tune totally reliably from the outset. Um, I'm looking at this, it's not even actually fitted on correctly, so it's slanted. So the chances are it's actually um, causing it to be slightly off in terms of intonation. So, as with all these things, there's a ton of glue on there and it brings with it a ton of wood, but that's how it was put, put on there. Um, <laughs> glue you see that I don't know what that is resin or something so we're going to have to do some work to level up this <coughs> the end of this um, we've got splitting of the fingerboard here as well which we might want to glue down as well so it doesn't eventually all come apart that is delaminating uh -uh. there's our truss rod adjuster in there um, I'm going to get my little tiny washer, extra washer that I saved. Now my, I'm hoping that when I use my 5mm hex doofer, that within a short period of time this will come right off. So this is the old, olden days type of truss rod adjuster. <coughs> and then it comes off just like that. And then down in there you've got a little head um, and or a little threaded bar. And what you've also got way down inside there, you've got yeah, the threaded bar. And we, what we want to try and do is to fit this on. Now, <laughs> you'll never be able to watch me do this because, first of all, it might not even be the right sized washer. I just happened to grab it. And I think, actually, given the fact this, if it was a four millimeter hex fitting, it might be the right size. but I think it might be too small a washer, which means, uh, which means it might not even go on. Um, so we can see, we can judge by the, we can judge by the gauge of this. Yeah, I think the inner diameter of that is much bigger than that. We could uh, try bending it and extending it but I think we might be better off in the medium to longer term to be having a go at finding another one. Of course what we can do is we can expand it out a little bit as if we were jewelers by putting it on something that will help us to um, maybe tap it down onto something like that which will expand it up a little bit. Put that in the vice a minute. It won't be very good visuals but just Hold on a sec, see if I can just widen it up. Because we only need a bit of grip. We don't really need much in the way of, um, it doesn't have to be perfect. So I'm using a piece of brass, only because it's right here. And I'm just going to tap this down and try and spread the, make it more of a circle up out of it. Okay. Of course, it's it's very easy to then drop it on the floor <coughs> and lose it. Okay, so that's basically widened that up somewhat. Now, a way of doing this would be if we can stick it to here. Um, <laughs> kind of difficult. Um, I don't know if it's magnetic. If it's magnetic we might 
get it to grip from one end to the other. Yes, and maybe, maybe. Yes, and maybe. And then we have to try and <laughs> get this into here. <coughs> well, that's not really going to work, is it? Not like, at least not with that. <coughs> so, this is aluminium. I think no, it can't be aluminium. It's got to be metal. Ah, you never know. We might just get down there with this. <laughs> well, that didn't come off, of course, because there's a magnet on the end. But if I can just get that to theory, in theory, if I can line that up on there, sort of knock it about a bit, and then find me pliers. Sorry, you can't see this bit. Now, if I take the I have to remove the magnet from the end here, cunningly. Now, theoretically, we might still have the washery thing at the end there. And with a bit of pushing and fiddling, you might think this might just bite and go on. But the truth is, it doesn't want to. And this is still dangling off there. So it's got a bit of residual magnetism. I think the problem with this is it's probably still not quite big enough to work. That magnet's going everywhere. Um, I mean, in a way, that's a sort of luxury um, outcome is to get this to fit. We might just have to go looking for something else. Um, got a container of washers over here. And they tend not to be miniature ones. So The problem is they've got to be large enough to go over the... Um, over the threaded bar, threaded rod, and small enough to go inside the tunnel, which doesn't apply to this one. Uh, I'll have a look in one more place over here. Oops, a daisy. What's in here? Fat drill bits, fiddly little things, but nothing looks like it will do this job. No, 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 no. There's my click lock thing. Ooh, I forgot that. Hmm. Once again, I think this might be a blank. So in a situation like this, um, I can either... It's not, it's, it's not absolutely essential because um, it worked when I adjusted it, but it just felt like I could do with it a bit of extra oomph. But getting that bit of extra oomph, I think, is going to require a bit of a longer search for a suitable... Uh, suitable washer to do the job. So that's going to have to go onto a, a back burner. Yeah, nothing in here. Uh, circlip. Uh, hmm, possibly. Circlip. Not, not exactly what it was intended for, but possibly, possibly uh, a fit. Actually, if I cut those little bits off there, this might actually... Now, the other way of getting this on, I discovered, is to get something like this and to run it down there, touching the end of the thing you want to put it over. And then there's some poking and stuff. Right, <laughs> that was easy. Let's see if that just goes back on. Would you look at that? Now, I think I could get two of those on there if necessary. So that's the, that's the, wow, that's good. Okay, I'll keep these, I'll keep one of these to hand, so in case we want a second one in the mix. I haven't really used these for anything else anyway, so it's a very nice bag, but wasted in life. Sorry. So that doesn't really work, that little one. I'll chuck it in there anyway. So I've got two more of these. Fabulous. Okay, so that's great. I've got, got one in there and two spares. So let's get those onto a magnet somewhere. Then I know I can find them again. You go up there. Lovely. That one goes up there. Okay, so now here's the fun bit. So... We know we've, we've got some 
gluing to do there. Now, the problem with this separation here is that it's splitting the finish um, and the only way to do anything about that is to refinish. Um, I know Dave is experienced finisher so I won't worry about that part of it. He can, he can put clear coat and in fact what we're planning I think is that I'll put a Morris decal on here and he's going to clear coat over it. So what I will make it my business to do right now is to try and just get some glue in here first. But well, um, before I get down to that, let's take off the let's take off the frets so we can get into the fretting mode. Now, to do that, I'm going to get a couple of bits of rubber, and I'm just going to put a clamp on there. Now, uh, let's do that way. Got a good view there. Not such a good view from behind. So, I'm going to use a simple method <coughs> that I perfected recently <laughs> um, of removing frets using just a um, blade. And you can use a blade with, with I, in my ebook, I showed how to um, mask it off with some tape to avoid hurting the fingers. But I found this is a pretty, except where it breaks the blade. It can be a pretty good way of getting the, at least getting the start of the frets lifting. Now that that's quite tight, so that feels stuck down. So we have our fret lifting um, pliers here, which we can bring into play once we've got that little bite, and it feels quite quite a crunchy uh, fit on these frets. It's like they're very very tightly in place. Well, I certainly are at the end, anyway. Now, let's see what we've got. There's a little bit of finish lifting, not finish, a little bit of the rosewood lifting there. Um, wow. Amazing old things. Let's see if we can continue to get this, use these blades to get the start bite. So the good thing about using a blade, I found, is you can get underneath the, um, the crown quite well. And actually with these, they are extremely flat to the, um, to the fingerboard. So there's hardly any grab, you know, grasp, <laughs> room to gra grab them. Um, no, that's amazing. Um, what it, see, the reason I quite like to use a blade like this instead of these is that these tend to have to want to, or tend, to tend to dig in quite a bit to get that first bite. So I've been trying to find different ways. Now, what did somebody else use? Oh, somebody showed me they used a knife, which I haven't got such a, a knife. But yeah, they used a knife in a similar fashion to just slide under that first bit. Um, I could probably use something like that, which might be a little bit stronger than this blade that I'm currently using. Um, let's see if I can use one of my older ones. Or the old style ones. Yeah, it used to used to be good as a start point. But it's actually it's showing, it's showing itself to be quite difficult to get anything under there. It's really tight to the Right to the board. Okay, there's a bit more of a chance on that end. So once it's under, you can sort of get that first lift. Yeah, I think I'll stick to this side. There you are. So I'm, I'm using the blade to get under the crown. Where it doesn't want to do it. Hopefully you get one end or the other. breaking chunks off. So it's done it on a couple of them. So it's a yeah, really, really heavily anchored, shall we say. There you go. I think it's getting that first, there you go, that first little bite under the crown. If you don't get that, you don't get it to move at all. If you do get it, it will come up, even if it bites chunks out of the blade. But it's getting it under, under the crown. There you go, and in it goes. Even if it's just enough to loosen it off, 
there you go, a little twist. So it's destroying this as I go, but you'll see that it's given me um, a lot easier access to the frets, and we can walk them along after that, a little bit by a little bit, and I'll save those and turn them around. But, uh, and I've got you know, hundreds of these leftover things, so I, I can afford to grind these away until the cows come home. Just enough to get that lift on the end. So what I found is if you get them flat and then <laughs> basically twist up the end, you get that lifting. And so you've got to be confident in holding this so it doesn't get under your into your own hands. There's the bite. There it is again. But even that is better than pushing down with these, which puts a sort of dent in the end. So you're starting off with less damage, even though it is a little bit, um, I don't know what the word would be, fraught, or can be scary if you've not done it before. Um, but the secret is getting the blade under that first bit of the crown and then pulling it back in and breaking the blade. Just that little bit of twist it needs. Now the problem with this, we're going to need to go over and glue all these in too, which is fine. We've got quite a bit of very liquid super glue. And then because the fingerboard has shrunk around these, you can currently feel them. But once I've radiused this again, not only will it look like a new board, um, but also the, uh, the um, we'll, we'll radius these inlays back to a lovely smooth finish um, which is about all we can do considering you know they're standing out because the wood has shrunk after all these years come on little shards of metal breaking off obviously so I'm kind of hoping that tonight, tonight, come on, there you go, hoping that tonight I'm going to have myself a real good time, I'm going to edit and upload this video all in the same 24 hours of time, earth time, and then, these are just blunt blades, but they'll do perfectly well for this, and then I'm going to see what it feels like to finish finish a oh no actually on this one i'm not going to am i because it's going to be a long video okay well okay i think what i'll do is i'll remove these first um and then i will come back with a bit of access room so um i'll just use the clippers now to squeeze in and prise the frets carefully out. Um, some people insist on uh, using fret protector strips. Some people insist on heating the frets. Um, I don't know, to soften, theoretically soften the wood or to cause the moisture to steam up in the wood. Um, but if you're careful anyway, and if it's not just if it's not inherently flaky, you'll get away with it like this. Um, there's a little bit came up in along the edge of that first one, but that's how it is. So, really carefully nibbling away. So one of the key things about this is to get this to work and you know, fret really well, or to get a good refret, we need to make sure that these slots, once we've radiused the board, we have to make sure the slots are really, really clean and free of all detritus. Um, and that's actually quite difficult when you've got a, a thin and very weak binding on it like this, a very fragile binding. So um, what we kind of have to do is 
to get in there and scrape it out in various different ways but you obviously don't want to push the ends because this won't take much invitation to snap off um, and bits of this white stuff I mean it could even come out as a, you know I'm taking these frets out now so what I will do is I will when I refret I will leave a lot of overhang so that I'll cut the tang inwards so that it doesn't go anywhere near these um, the, the bound edges so it means we can also stay away from the edges when I'm cleaning out the slots we can afford to leave a little bit of gunge in each of these corners if we have to um, now the downside of leaving too long an overhang is that the um, there's nothing really to keep the crown that's now sort of flapping out there on its own there's nothing to keep the crown down following the radius of the fingerboard and that's a bit of a, a problem um, a little bit of super glue at the point of fretting can be a way of overcoming that um, which in this case might be a better way of doing this guitar to super glue it quite often I will do um, you know I'll try to stick to wood glue for the glue that I use but if we are going with a longer overhang here to avoid damaging the binding uh, then I think I might go super glue um, what super glue it provide, presents is a little bit harder to clean up afterwards um, and even if you've got super glue deep on you still can't really do an adequate clean up job as you go um, but you can you can adequately scrape very carefully scrape the rosewood afterwards to remove the glue so I think I will do that because I think we will need to extend the overhangs to preserve the binding um, so as you can see already um, while you know while, while the gu guitar itself is very simply made as soon as you take an old guitar like this apart you can see that we've already got some problems to that need taking care of like the the fingerboard splitting away from the neck like the these rattling inlays because they're they're basically going to come out um they've shrunk sorry they haven't shrunk sometimes they do shrink um in this case it's the it's the wood that shrunk no it can't be sorry it's not the wood the wood has shrunk that's almost certain but what's happened is the inlays have shrunk a bit as well so they've got smaller and can fall out but um, they're also sticking up because the wood around them has shrunk in volume as well so that's quite a complex mixture of shrinkings going on but together they end up meaning that we've got to glue them all back in so there's that to take care of as well Come on, come on, up you come. I'm going to take this off as I go, otherwise I won't have room. Um, yeah, I won't be able to get the blade in if I just leave these sticking up. So this this is a f um, one of these tools that would be great if it was, um, what am I thinking, spring to open. I, want it, I don't want to have to keep doing it with like this and I get and to control it with two hands like a chopsticks or something. So I want to get under this tang and lift. There we go. I've got you under my tang. So the plan for tonight is dragging out a bit. I was hoping to I'll do an acoustic setup, which I still might have time to do because it won't take too long, I don't think. Um, I was going to do an acoustic setup. I was hoping to strip this down and potentially fret this neck as well as the um, JT's Star Force neck, so maybe we still will. Um, I mean, I'm not in any particular rush. Up 
become bits of metal. Right. Yeah, so it's going to be potentially, um, maybe not on this one because this one will be a long drawn out one, but in the case of the acoustic one that's hanging over there, for those of you watching in Sony Vision, it's that one. Um, that one I'll sh should finish tonight, so um, the idea we'll have a, a done video tonight, which I can then um, compile in Final Cut Pro and export and upload to YouTube with our new hypersonic bandwidth, which is incredible after seven years of seven years, at least seven years of. Well, since I've been doing Relove guitars for seven years, uh, every year, one of those years in doing this, I've been working on broadband that's ranged from dial-up to barely better than dial-up recently. <laughs> um, so this is, <sighs> this is... This one doesn't want to do anything. Um, this is the first, will be the first time that... This is the first time that I've ever been able to really upload really loved videos from home. So it's an it's a end of one era and beginning of another. Okay. So I think that's the, that's all of the, all of the uh, frets out. Frets out. Okay, so let's just do, do a little check here because I think typically this would be a uh, well, it's not a twelve; it's tighter than a twelve. It's possibly even tighter than a nine point five, but it's a little flatter in the centre than a seven G five. So I think its nearest relative, if I avoid the inlays, its nearest relative is nine point five. That's important to know, so I'm going to write that down. Hondo 9.5. Now, as you well know, that's not a very Les Paul type of radius, but um, what I wouldn't want to do is change it because I don't want this feeling like a different guitar. So we will stick with that. Now, I think the thing I would like to do now is I want to ensure straight away that these um, in inlays stay in. So I'm going to use my very, uh, whatever the word is, runny super glue to go around the edges of these. Now you can see it's obviously overflowing onto the board, but I'm going to run over this I'll run it over. Okay, that's quite interesting. That's, that's quite a it's got a lot of flexibility in there. Mm, blimey. Hmm. A bit tricky that because um, so it's sticking up. I'm not really trying to get it to stay there very easily. Unless I can hold it for long enough. If it doesn't stay down by being held, then I might try some accelerant. Right, stay in there. That's the way I'm going to have to do it. I wonder if this is too runny. Well, it's better that it goes under than not at all. Yeah, we better go with the runny. That one was unusual in that it was sticking right up. Got a bit of bounce to it. This one might do as well. So 
okay. We'll scrape the excess stuff off with the re-radiusing. Just want these glued in solid. This glue boost, um, this stuff is running right the way under here. They shrunk so much that they're sitting on a pad of crunchy glue that's sort of sticking up as well as, so it's, it's making, yeah, look, you can see it's, it's kind of going all over the place. So. It might be worth leaving overnight. Okay. Yeah, it's um, it shrunk so that it's. I think what what tends to happen is it's either straightened out, or it's um, it, the wood has shrunk away. So it's it's certainly sticking up proud. And you can see I'm sort of starting to bend it down. Um, She go. Yeah, that will do. That will do. <sighs> Messy at the moment, but it will work. That the other one, I could see it wicking under there, like gallons of it going underneath, because there's such an air gap underneath these things. But yeah, this glue boost accelerant is is really expensive. Can you hear the magpies? But yeah, this is this is all sort of sticking up because of the shrinking. And it, I can see this filling up with glue right underneath the the um, inlay. Press down on this lifting end. <coughs> nice smelling, but expensive. About 15 quid for that little tank, and that all gets used up. We'll be gone in a minute with this. Okay, these look all right, these last ones, miraculously. I know it's still loose. <laughs> I can feel it. I can feel it. I can feel it. I can feel it. Right. That's that bit. Mucky for now. But we'll clean up. So we say 9.5, don't we? Maybe maybe it's better if I just do it on here, and then I'll vacuum this off. So 9.5, I'm starting out, I've got a piece of, I think this is about 80 grits, it's quite fierce, but it'll be okay for starting off, taking the lumps off the top. Now, if you're going to use a radius block like this, the one thing you want to be sure is that this is as flat as it can be. And this is as flat as it can be because I already know um, that the truss rod is currently loose. So at this point, I'm just cutting off the glue and the excess uh, mother of pearl it's sticking up. do is just clean out the unclog the sandpaper as they go. <sighs> now this is um, also clogging up the what's it's slots but it's not glue it's just dust so we won't have uh, too much trouble cleaning them out um, but we can't assume that it's going to be easy all the way <sighs> courtesy of the danger presented by the binding. So 
as we get into this sort of slowly cut down through the crusty material and you'll see it start to cut away some of the deeply oiled looking wood or just start to shave it down a little bit and that's that's as we're cleaning cleaning this up and eventually we'll end up with a nice smooth surface that will be good for fretting um, if I wasn't happy with this paper I would take this off and stick some new paper to it but this is actually not bad for the time being what I'll probably end up doing is putting some new 120 on once I've got the 80 stuff done now radius block is a is a difficult thing to use because it's not very scientific and it moves a little bit from side to side as you use it so you can always get very slightly off the actual radius you're looking for um, but it's not too bad if you're careful I mean a much better way would be to is to have a a routing jig that cuts uh, cuts a radius with a router but you know that might I think that would be too extreme for this when you re you're really not reshaping this and you're certainly not working with a blank fingerboard so what we're really doing here is just cleaning it up So this is old sandpaper, which isn't so bad because it's taking its time to cut this. You can see uh, it's slowly going down, but this will be smooth by the time we get where we want to get. Um, some, sometimes people ask you to, can you put, um, can you do inlays for me? Um, and inlays are, on one level, they're sort of easy. Well, not easy. They're, they're doable, but the problem with inlays is that you you can't really do them unless you're refretting the guitar, because by by definition the inlay is a flat piece of material usually, and you're putting it into a curved radius surface. So what's for sure is that you're going to get a mismatch, and some of it's going to stick up out of the curved fingerboard surface and when that happens it looks crap and feels crap but the only way you can really get in between frets to, to for example smooth off the uh, inlays like I'm doing here is you, you could only the only way you possibly do it is with a blade and you can't take down that much um, mother of pearl for example with the edge of a blade just between two frets particularly two very close together ones so I often say somebody wants a um, you know different inlays or changing inlays I'm I'm the first one who's going to say I recommend you, you refret at the same time because otherwise you might as well if you're spending money on it but the, if you don't I won't be able to guarantee you smooth rounded inlays radius inlays so So you quickly reveal where there are flat spots, there's one sort of running down there. We'll eventually get to the bottom of it. Um, we do want to make sure that we're still in the land of 9.5, we're just about there. Now what I think I'll do now is I think it's time to swap this out for a fresh bit of paper. So <coughs> I think we'll go with 120 at this point. So the thing to do is to get this cut exactly to the right dimension, length. 
or torn to the right length like that. And then we have to put tape onto the block itself and then we'll put the paper onto the tape. And it's always a good idea to either rub off the stuff if you can, or if you can't rub it off, get some solvent onto it and solvent it off. Just so what you don't really want is lumps of glue or stuff sticking up, causing a bump in the paper to dig in at any point. So it's kind of pretty important that it's nice and smooth like that. pretty quickly so we'll need to do one down the middle like that just chop it like that and then line one up next to it like that again being very very careful not to overlap these pieces so what I'll be aiming for is that but before I do that, I just want to cut off the excess along the side so I can see exactly what I'm doing. So over the next few weeks, I've got lots of interesting things to do. I've got, um, I've got two candy apple paint jobs to do. JT. Um, these are pre-painted uh, pre-painted guitars that we're going to we're going to overpaint with nitro and turn them into candy apple. And we're following the Manchester Guitar Techs combinations of paints, which is kind of nice because he shows a way of well shows how he did it, and you know it's a good-looking result. So I think okay, I'll stick with what he says. Um, and his, he produces a, a gold paint that we're going to use. Whoops, now that is sticking out one end fractionally. We'll get away with it. That's not brilliant. There's a little bit of sticky tape stuff sticking out that top end, but it'll survive. Okay, so that was that was getting our radius block with some fresh paper on it. It should make this next bit easier. Um, it's fresh, but it's less the grain, the grain, the gr grit is smaller than before. So it should it'll cut quite nicely. Um, but it will be a smoother cut. And this way, I'm not going to press as hard now. So I want to let this even this all out nicely. Again, I can just see a couple of flat spots here, here, and a tiny little one there to work on. Again, unclog the uh, paper. Yeah, so a couple of candy apple paint jobs and what with it being summer and everything, I'm sure that it's going to be perfect nitro spraying weather any minute now, which will make things a lot easier. If you're sort of controlled with your spraying, you're not fighting the elements, um, then it's a, it is a lot easier thing to do and you can get a much more careful paint job done. Last little bit still in there. So the, one of the main reasons for uh, refinishing, no, what's this word? Re-radiusing. Some people obviously want to preserve the ancient vintage mojo of the guitar as evidenced by the grooves and the decay and the fingerboard and stuff and I get it that's fine 
one of the reasons um, when I give people the option on it, as I think, say to them, whilst I appreciate that's a nice thing to preserve the sort of vintage spirit of the guitar, um, concern that I have is my interest is that I want the smoothest, most even surface possible for um, doing the refret, for seating the new frets. So for me, I get a, I can have a better guarantee of that happening if I can re-radius the board and I know that this is nice and smooth. I still feel a bit of grime still down there, which needs to come out. But, you know, so, you know, the downside is that it loses its ancient feel. The upside for me is that I can promise, uh, give a better promise of level fretting. So that's what I'm, I tend to have to point out. And I point out that um, if you really do want to keep the original sort of unevenness of the board, then that's fine. But I can't guarantee, 100% guarantee the smoothness or the evenness of the reef route. I'll get it even in the end because um, worst comes to the worst. Uh, you know, the frets may not go in 100% level, but then we uh, level them out with leveling beam. But it's like all these things, it's like when you're recording sound, you know, the old thing is if you get it, the cleaner and the better the initial recording is, um, the better you're going to be. You, c you really can't fix a bad recording. Um, so you've got to get it right to begin with, rather than trying to fix something. So it's the same applies here. Get the basic surface that you're going to put the frets into. Um, as good as possible. Now what I'm doing is I'm running along here cleaning these frets out a little bit. Oops, I've gone over the board there. Typical. Um, I'll just do a little bit more sanding to get rid of that. Um, going over this, but the what you get is that the dust clogs quite strongly in the slot. So rather than pull it through the end and burst out the other side, you have to sort of train yourself to stop before the end and We'll turn it around and come the other way. And we'll gradually unclog it that way. Okay. Um, I think I will now go to, um, I'll do a little bit more and then I'll go to, I think the grain will be 240 and that will be that. This next one we'll get a bit of 240. Now this time we, c we can, if we want, we could uh, glue it on on top of this one or we could uh, just wrap it round. The danger of wrapping it around, I think, is that you get a slight, potentially slight curve on the edge. So it's better to take the time to um, fix it rather than <laughs> rather than wrap it hand by hand. But it takes a bit more time, obviously. Well, definitely everything's taking longer at the moment. I don't know why. that Bring up this Sorry. 
Okay, okay. Well, I'll get as much as I can done tonight. Um, it may be that I don't get the refretting done, but we're set up for tomorrow anyway. Everything's tidy and prepared, so that's good. When, last time I did this, I, I went and put it on that way down. God knows why, but I did. Okay, uh, this will be the last uh, gray that I'll do on here. 240 is plenty smooth enough to play on. Or you can hand sand it. Sometimes I go over it. Once I've done the cleaning out the slots, I can go over it by hand a little bit. And this is the last bit. So I'm kind of, in my head, I'm focusing on the middle part of the board here because my experience is that bit can sometimes get ignored while the edges get rounded over a bit. So I'm sort of trying to press right down in the middle now. See if I can just get that as good as possible. Dust. There you go. And with a bit of what you call it, naphtha on there, you can see the grain nicely as well. Okay, we're almost there. A little clean up of this, a little another go, and I'll be done. Okay, I'm gonna uh, stop this for a minute because I'm gonna next move on to prepare, and I have to do a bit of cleaning up, prepare for the acoustic. So that will be it for this video, um, but I will come back when it's time to. Uh, refret. So see you in a little bit. Time to go. We've got stuff in the back. We've got kitchen roll there. Beautiful evening. Time to head out. Can't get much more beautiful than a dappled summer's evening here in Devon. Little stop on the way up. I mean, it's such a beautiful part of the country. Look at this. Don't worry over in that direction. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stick this here, if I can. Can I stick it there? Can I stick it here? Can I stick it everywhere?
good, good shot at it. I think he has got one. Got some room they can get past there. Thank you very much, Mr. Farmer. Thank you. Um, Ready to do some um, that thing fretting, and we've got two next to fret. This one, they're both going to have the same fret wire. This one's going to be 9.5 radius, um, which is unusual for a, an old Les Paul copy. Now, I'm going to do one sort of last preparation, make sure that the slots are clean, and well, before I go there, I'm going to check what we've got in the way of tang width here. It's actually quite wide on the original, um, so it's gonna be comfortable fit. Actually, it's about exactly the same. Maybe, maybe this is a fraction smaller, this new stuff, so we may be grateful for the glue after all of that. So I'm going to use super glue on this. Um, it's so close, that's 0 0.6, this is 0.57, something like that. It's very, very close but we shall see. And that was a little off cut just for the test purposes. Now, um, I'm gonna, as I get going, I've got my mirror here to see what view I've got, which is sort of lots of table, cup of tea. Um, so I'm going to drink my tea. Now this is, um, this is on a sort of fixed level of volume because I'm not using the uh, plug-in headphone thing. <clears throat> so when it comes to it, I'm going to need to just make sure this is boosted loud enough. Anyhow, so this old beastie, um, I glued the neck last night, clamped it and came back to it today. So any splitting should have been cured. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just to go through the whole of the, all of the frets, slots, and basically very carefully ensure that they're all clean cleaned out and there's still going to be a little tiny bit possibly in each one coming out there and my main thing here is to ensure that you can hear the cows mooing <laughs> Saturday night in the country I'm going to make sure that um, I don't cut through to the end here and bust this very delicate binding because it's vintage and cracked um, and it won't take kindly to being hit on by a blade coming at it. So this is the sort of the very last in the sequence of uh, clean outs. Now this one got quite a bit of crud built up on the end and built up on the bottom of the slot. So I'm going to go turn it around and go the other way in a minute, make sure we get everything out. You can always feel it when it's caught um, at the bottom. It sort of rides up over a compressed lump of detritus anyway so i've had a, a really nice day a slow day today um because it's been sunny i have waited for and booked myself some time in the sun in the hammock doing nothing so i've really enjoyed a bit of that in fact a couple of hours this afternoon just really just outside the hottest bit of the sun and into the, the later part of the day or the later part of the afternoon, cooler part. Okay, so there's a, there's a sort of compressed goo here. It's lifting out quite a bit. Yeah, so I had a, yeah, a couple of hours in the old hammock and that's such a luxurious thing to think, okay, now let's get up and get ready for work. And work means driving up through the most beautiful green Devon countryside to get up to this workshop where I can sit down and play with guitars or make guitars or fix guitars, whatever. But it's a, it's an absolute joy, really. I never forget how blessed I am to be able to do it. Um, and although I said before, it it's, doesn't make <coughs> doesn't make a ton of money. Um, and that's, that's in part because I don't chase chase it, you know, I'm not sort of 
I'm not marketing hard to try and fill every second of every day with customer work. Um, in fact, I've got it, as probably many of you will know, I've got it pretty much exactly how I like it, which is that I don't have to do any selling at all. Um, I have a, a, a reliable and very just about right uh, stream of incoming customer inquiries or bookings, um, which keeps me in enough money to pay the bills um, and keep Morris fed in cat food and his brothers and sisters and brothers from other mothers. And um, yeah, it's a very nice pace for my liking. Um, you know, and there's, there's a little part of me that sort of thinks about, oh, let's, you know, perhaps I'll be more ambitious and, you know, maybe we'll take it to the next level and all that kind of uh, Dragon's Den language. Um, and I'm the sort of person who will do that when the right opportunity either comes along or strikes me at the right time or you know my thought process goes that way at the right time so I'm not the kind of person who is obsessed with growing something for growth's sake um, I like to do it when it's right and when the market or the situation is right for it so if I'm not growing the business in inverted commas right now it's because it's it's just it's not it hasn't grabbed me to do it now these slots ladies and gentlemen are clean um it's time to cut the frets for this baby now this you saw yesterday was it, yeah well in the last video there's a problem there's quite a bit of problem with this neck pocket on this guitar um i don't know how well you can see this so we have a straight bit here i'm going to cut this is it the straight bit? Oh, no, actually, it's not bad. Um, I've cut the straight bit off these. So I'm going to cut like this. Um, oh, my pliers are given, giving up the ghost on that side. That's a bit rubbish. Um, yeah, so we've got, a, we've got a heel problem on this here. Let's just do this this side, Sam. Come on. What was I trying to do? I don't want to... Hey, hey. I'm going to cut down against there. Yeah, we've got a heel problem. Um, there. It's definitely a bit of a hill climb in there, in the pocket. Uh, sorry, it's a pocket problem. Um, so we're going to have to do some fixing of that. Um, it, it was working before, the neck was clamped in place, but there's a lot of fresh air under there and who knows what the angle is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of shim it Perhaps with a piece of tin or something, I'll get the get the shim exactly right, get the neck to the right angle, and then I'm going to prepare the heel to do something I've done before, which is I I um, mix up some resin, a quick, fairly quick dry resin, and I set it into the heel. Um, I press, sorry, set it into the pocket. I cover the heel in thin cellophane, like cling film or something, and then I press the heel in to the pocket and kind of clamp it in place. Um, and what happens is the excess will come out through the holes and we can always drill those out again anyway. So we can keep those as clean as we can, the bolt, the screw holes, um, but it's not critical. Um, and then we just let it dry. And then what happens is we remove the neck and, and the set resin underneath the cling film usually makes a pretty flat, um, base and so we've got a kind of um, triangle of resin uh, in place and it helps to put the the neck angle onto a prop it up in the right sort of horizontal position but it does a pretty good job of it so the neck heel itself creates the, the sort of flat pocket in this resin um, and the times I've done it before it does a very good job of leveling the pocket regardless of the holes because the holes in there at the moment are too shaggy to really do anything practical with um you know we're not gonna i can't put wood in there i'd, I'd have to route it out put a piece of an insert in and then route back down again to the correct height i mean that's one way of doing it um 
I'll have a look. Right. That could be a spare. Yeah, that's a spare one at the top here. Put it off to one side. Um, yeah, so it's you know it's possible to do it that way. I'll, I'll just look and see which is the most desirable. The problem with um, the problem I think with doing a route is the the uh, right now at the rounded end. Yeah, the problem with doing a route is that we've got a sort of curved or a carved top or molded top, I should say. So it makes using a template and a router a little bit difficult. It's not impossible, but it's quite a bit more difficult. So you can see here, I'm cropping, chopping all the frets ready and um, leaving a bit of overhang because we've got plenty enough fret material left over. Um, you can only buy this in two meters, or sorry, one meter things. So it requires two meters, but you get this much left over. So uh, I will put a, a tab on it so I know what it is in case I want to use it in the future. Now the next thing I'm going to do with this is I'm going to find a thinner pen. Actually no. So what we're going to do next is start preparing or trimming one end of the uh, one end of the frets, get it all too close to level. I've got another two bits over there to do the um, JT's one with which is going to be 12 inch radius. So we have, oh, I don't even know what the grade is. <laughs> yes, medium jumbo. I and mean, I can put 12 inch, but I have to then go back through my, oh, sorry, 9.5 inch radius. It's, I know it's medium, but I don't know the exact height. Two point something. This is, this is where I get a bit stuck because I, where did I buy it from? Tone Tech. If I can't find immediately, very quickly, um, the receipt or something, I will lose track of what, very quickly lose track of what this wire is called. So let us see, can I find Tone Tech? Come on. Tone, no, time, thank you. Tone, Tone Tech Lucia Supplies. Thank you for your recent order. It didn't tell me what I bought. So, so that's that's no good. There's the thing saying maybe it's not in the inbox. Maybe it's in. Oh, come on, man. Maybe it's in. Right, let's go to Gmail. This is too confusing. Gmail. T O N E. Turn text. The order is shipped. Order confirmation. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. That is good. Now I know what it is. Hurrah. So I'm back to here. It is Jessica F W. Five double one hundred. Five double one hundred. Right, now that finally will mean I can use this some other time. I've got so many bits of wire that I can't quite place what they are. Right, okay, so what I'm going to do is, the next bit, is I'm going to start now by preparing the undercuts, the underhangs. So I get my fret tang, my tang nippers, and I line them up and badly cut. So now this is, annoys me because for some reasons, sometimes this just doesn't work cut right. Um, other times it does. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut these with a fair old overhang, or not a huge amount, but enough to clear those potentially mucky edges. Um, the, if efficiency of these clippers kind of depends on you doing as little up in one go as possible um, and then you can usually get a clean a cleanish cut um, I don't really need to trim the ends of these to be honest although I sort of like to 
Um, so what I'll do is I'll go all the way down. They, they, they feel like they're fitting in nicely. These will actually, they are a right fit. It's a very comfortable tang fit, which is good for a change. I don't want, sometimes you have to widen them a little bit and you can buy a number of tools to try and widen them. But if it's always a difficult thing if you're, um, if you're working with a binding and especially a very fragile binding because um, you're going to, uh, it's hard to, you have to use a bit of force to widen the slots or a bit more force. And sometimes that can end up with you kind of scraping too hard and breaking the, this very delicate binding. So as you can see, I'm, I'm going to lay these frets out. I'm going to cut the overhang comfortably on all of them. Um, I'm going to use super glue on this fretting so I know I can hold the ends down because I'm making them a tiny bit longer, uh, making the tang free part a bit longer. So the secret of using these nippers is to not get the wrong side of these damn things. New ones required. I think I need to, um, I think I need to put half of this off limits because it's got a little bite out of the blade and it's not working properly. Yeah, um, what was I gonna say? Yeah, the secret of the nippers is not to take too much in one go. If you take too much, it tends to um, fold it back uh, rather than cut it and then you have to sort of pull it off with your pliers. See that felt folded a bit there. It's always the way you think about it too much and hang around too much and you'll end up with this piece of wire sticking up and then trim it back. What you want to avoid doing at all costs is bending up that little bit of the, the crown that overhangs. If you get that bent up or so anything you do distorts that, um, you will struggle. Now there's something, um, I'm gonna look, at, look again at this because when I use these pliers, um, I don't think it's the tang nippers, although these don't want to work. When I use the pliers, I put this in like this, and go like that, and I'm getting, uh, it's not now, it's on the cutting of wire, isn't it? I'm getting a little, a little ding on the fret wire when I'm cutting it like that, holding it off. I knew there was something going on. That's okay. It's only very minor, but I had noticed it before and I had to, I made a mental note to myself saying, got to find out where this little, little, um, impression gets put onto the fret because it's it's just something to keep an eye out for and I think it's in the way I hold the wire this way and bring bring the thing over it like this and I think it's on the edge I think it's what it is it's on the very edge here damn it not really another way to cut it without getting a twist which is also what I'm trying to avoid anyhow I must remember it for the next lot, if I can find another way to cut it. Okay, so this stage of the game is all slow and plodding along, but it's quite nice. Now what I won't do is I won't force you to sit through all of it because it's, um, it's just the same old. Um, when I get through lining these all up like this, I will so mark them up, cut them, crop them short. I want a little bit of overhang, but the less overhang that I have to, to trim off with the um, um, beveling block, the better in a way, because it just it's quite a crude process and it requires, again, a fair bit of brute force or repetition. And, and it's an area where you can get problems occurring or you can have errors. So that the less material you have to sort of wear away with brute force the better um, on some very very delicate jobs you'll see me trying to do almost all of the end preparation of the frets before putting them on the fretboard and then um, putting them on the guitar i should say um, and this uh, you could argue this is potentially one because the binding is so so delicate, you might argue that this is one where I should consider uh, doing the end beveling 
before I put the frets on um, and so that maybe if we use the end beveling block at all it's the minutest amount um, right at the end so again I'll, I'll have a look at this as we get to the end of this trimming process I mean one way as I said to help make sure there's not too much material is to get this trimming part done really well bits of metal everywhere now and um, that's you know that's quite easy to do in the sort of off the guitar sort of position all the other parts arrived they're up on the workbench so you know we, we've got a we could get a very quick progress on this which is nice um but i have still like i say i have to make a decision on that um neck pocket uh it's possible well the difficult the difficulty in filling that neck pocket with an insert um, is getting the insert the right shape to begin with. Um, we could probably take a sort of make it a template. Hmm. It, would, it might, we might be able to make a template. Let's see that link. <laughs> These magnets are very good, but sometimes they get in the way. Um, yeah, we might be able to make a, a decent template. So this doesn't want to cut cleanly now. I'm in the sort of stuck position with this damn thing. And that's that's okay, but what I can see is it's got a fair bit of material sticking up. Um, and I would be, I have to be sort of, that's it, scraped it off. So you can get caught out where you leave where it struggles to cut with the tang nippers and you end up leaving a, a sort of little ridge of uncut that's a clean cut you see and so is that one um but it, otherwise you might you can just leave this little ridge of tang root you might call it and uh that runs the risk of causing the fret to stick up just slightly at that end so it only needs a tiny little interruption like that or obstruction and You've got a high fret which is going to cost you time and effort in leveling although you know it's it's exactly what you have to do once you put your frets on um i think it i don't know how many what the ratio is but it's probably something like one in 25 or 30 frettings um only one in about 30 25 30 frettings that it'll be good enough from tapping them in to just playing them without doing any leveling it's it's more accidental than um on purpose or you know skill so what i'm going to do now is i'm just going to just check the edges here there's enough overhang for all of these in some cases for fraction too much i just don't want to be grinding away at stuff where we don't need to do it we don't just a, we need we need to we want to reach the edge that's for sure we don't want it short of the edge, whatever we do, but we don't want it a ton further than the edge. Okay, make sure everything touches the edge, and then we have a, uh, a sort of marking. Now, sometimes I use the other marker, sometimes I use this one. This one's not waterproof, so it's easy to come off. But it doesn't have to stay on here very long, and this one is thinner. So it's kind of a bit more accurate. Um, so what I'll do is just use this as a guide for cutting back and undercutting again at the far end. And then we are sort of ready to think about the leveling, uh, not the leveling, the tapping them in. Now, or ta in this case, I'm going to use the press. Um, what makes me make that decision? Well. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I when I when I have a choice. I mean, quite often I have a choice. Like I have a choice here. I could use the wood blocks to tap these in, um, but it feels right. It feels like it will be a straightforward press in, and everything will sit nicely. So I'm thinking the good thing about the um, it's not very good light here, actually. Believe it or not, thinking the good thing about say using the press is that it's a much more is this um correct is it crooked no i think it's right 
Um, yeah, it's a, it's a more, it's an even and it's a predictable, dependable, consistent force all the way through. So I think that's probably the good reason for doing it with the press. Um, I often you do do uh, tapping when it's uh, maybe a bound neck or things are hard to get to. Um, now with this, by the way, what I can do next is I can now, if I want to, I can now bevel by hand each of these pieces when I've got them to the right length. And it's, uh, it's up to me if I want to pre-bevel them. Um, and I can do it with um, either, oh, I see that's now crimped that. Can do it with sandpaper by hand, or I can use. He's just lost the mark. I can use the um, Dremel with a sanding drum on it, which is quicker and, and simpler in many ways. Okay. So you see, we're progressing along nicely. this again for JT's Star Force neck in a minute but it's good to do one at a time and this part of it anyway so we don't lose focus on what we're doing that seats very easily cleanly without twisting anything. Okay. I think that should be okay. Yep. Just long enough. Uh, we've got plenty of spare, that's the nice thing. <coughs> so if something does mangle, we can easily make a replacement. So I think that the fact that these um the way these hang cutters work can can leave a little like I say a little sort of stem at the bottom uh, could be one of the reasons why sometimes it the frets don't want to sit down as easily as they should um, what the other thing that the <coughs> the cutters are doing uh, the tang cutters are doing is as I chop this tang now they're putting a sometimes they put a little twist in the edge of the very end of the tang and actually Sometimes I don't want that if it's if it's already a tight fit. But in this case, if it's just on the fit and I want an extra little bit of grip, that tiny twist isn't a bad thing. Uh, you can buy if you have to if you're in a situation where you really have to um, you've got slots that are too loose. Um, you you can buy uh, custom-made luthier tools which are, allow you to put cut some little flanges into the frets. Uh, I suppose you might call it. Um, but I've actually found you can do that yourself with the pliers. You can twist and bite a little, <clears throat> or bite a little twist in the tang, um, which makes it wider and will grab the wood better. So, it, like with all things, you don't have to spend hundreds of pounds. This one's quite convenient, um, but you can do this undercutting with a Dremel blade. It just takes time, or you can do it with a file. Um, again, time consuming, but you know, old fashioned craftsmanship. And I always say to people, don't let it put you off doing a refret, you know, just because you haven't got the luthier tools. Everything is doable in the refretting. Um, it's just, it will take a little bit more time and care if you don't have the tools. And that's really, I think it's a typical definition of tools. It, most tools are, are more time savers than they are, than they are making something impossible possible. Of course, there are tools like that that you just simply couldn't do without them. But the vast bulk of things you see in the luthier world, or I think a majority of things, are, are time saving tools. Um, which of course you you're very good.
grateful to have when you do a lot of setups, um, you know, a lot of repeated setups. But I think there's nothing in the fretting world, no, no part of the fretting job that requires, absolutely 100% requires specialist tools. And I, my second ebook, The Six Steps to Guitar Build Heaven, shows how to refret the guitar using just plain simple tools. So there's my ready cut fret set, fret set for this. Now, like I said, um, the beauty of the fret, the end beveling file, is that it it cuts everything to a consistent level. And if you were to do this by hand and put a bevel on the end of each fret, um, the, the the nice thing is is you can get you can get the frets. Bevel. The bad thing is you can't always control the overall length because it's manual. So this is probably not the right way to do it, but let's say uh, this is a sanding block. It's a bit of a curved one, but let's say I was going to put a bevel on the end of this. Now I'm doing it purely by hand and it's actually it's quite a nice, um, relaxed way of doing it. And I'm not quite sure what sort of shape it will put on there but it's pretty quite nice so you get yourself a, an end bevel there and you can place it down there get it slightly very very slightly overlapped um, and it, the issue with this now is you, this is where you have to be incredibly accurate and I've got the lighting isn't quite doing it for me what you want when you do a do it like this is you you want to avoid you want the fret to begin just inside or just at the join line between the um, binding and the wood. Um, what I think I might just do as I'm trying to make these points is take all of these off and just work with the one. So uh, this means if I'm going to do this by hand like that, again, with no special tools, not even a Dremel. Um, I mean, the Dremel's good, but actually you also can't control it quite so well. If you really want fine tune control then use you know hand tools like this so i'm just lining all these up in their right order and then if i come back to this one i can sort of see now that that's probably right at a good end good position at this end and that's too long over that end so i i need to sort of work this one back a bit so again i'm going to sort of run it at a 45 degree angle i'm just guessing it really um you know, and if you were listening to your favourite tunes or something, you wouldn't really be in any, any particular hurry. So you've got your fret beveled at either end, similar sort of angle. And then what you're looking to do is you're putting it on and you're, the next thing you're doing is you're checking the, the grip on your hands. Now, this is still too long. It overhangs the um, that thing. Binding overhangs the binding, and as a result, because it's overhanging, we'll we'll catch on the fingers as we come back up, as we pull our fingers up across it. So the only way around that is to basically work it back down. Now this is a slow way of doing that. Um, if you did use a Dremel, you'd get there a little bit quicker, but you, again, you could risk going too far. So the idea would be, we want to get this um, lined up. And I keep thinking I've got all the other ones on there I have to watch out for. I want this one on here and now I'm sort of getting to the place where that's almost perfect. Maybe a little tiny bit at the other end again. So I think, you know, as a handmade thing, um, this is a way to get every single fret cut to the right length. But you just have to be absolutely precise. You cannot, you know, if, if you're going to get this right, if you don't want it to look like the edge of the... Um, the frets, you know, the line like rail tracks looked at in the distance. If you don't want it to look like it snakes off, you have to make sure that your the edge of your fret stops exactly on the binding each time. Um, and that takes a bit of concentration. But I think I might just carry on and do that because more than anything, I'm, I'm concerned that if I put an edge beveling block on this, although I'll do it on JTs because that is much stronger. Um, well, there's, there's no um, binding to break. But I think I'll do these by hand. Um, I'll come back after I've done it because I want to preserve this vintage mojo here. And it's just a matter of time. There's no extra hassle in doing it this way. It's just going to take me some time. So I'm going to stop this recording. I'm going to listen to the radio and I'll, 
come back when these are all ready to press in and we'll go from there. Um, first things first, we could put some light on, I suppose. First things first is I've done quite a few things. I've temporarily, well, I've put the tunes back on. I've finished the fret ting. I've leveled the frets. And I'm preparing the heel to do the resin um, fix. No, if you remember, the resin was, um, the resin's going to level up the base of the thing, the pocket, which is a bit of a mess at the moment. So to do this, what I need to be able to do is I need to be able to refit the neck, first of all, um, with, it's got some plastic on, sort of making things a little bit difficult. So I'm going to refit the neck. Um, I need a different thing for it. Screwdriver bit. Um, yeah, I'm going to refit the neck. And I'm going to make sure, I put a shim in there, which is a little, probably a little bit thicker than the Craven A shim that we found in it. And so what I'm aiming to do is to get this all done up and just check that with that particular shim that I've put in, make sure that this um, kind of comes out in the right geometry that we want. If it's just about right, and I'd rather it was a little higher than too low, because I don't, I, I want to be able to get the strings lower. Um, so I'm just going to do this up a minute. take out, so I'm going to use some uh, fake Ernie Ball strings, okay so this is the neck in, um, I'm going to put the bridge on temporarily, we're going to waste a set of Ernie Ball fake strings, I don't even know why I'm calling them Ernie Ball, they're complete fakes, Chinese fakes, they're probably full to bits, but I'm just going to use these to establish, make sure that we've got good geometry with, with this shim. So I only need them to tighten up a bit and then they go in the bin after that. Actually, we could even use them a bit further on for fret leveling. But so let's just thread them all through. Um, and if I'm, if this is in the right sort of height and everything's sitting where it should, then what I'll do is I will remove the neck again. We'll put the fret, the fret. We'll put the shim. Make sure the shim stays where it is, and then I'm going to mix up some resin, and we're going to dollop that resin into the pocket, refit the neck, and allow the excess to squirt out through the holes, um, or two of the holes. We'll we'll fit with two. We'll let it sort of squirt out, and then we'll we'll kind of. Um, we'll let it set, but then we have to sort of take, it's a bit tricky, we have to take the screws out before they get stuck. We don't want the screws to get stuck in there. They usually will, they'll pull the resin out normally when it's still a little bit soft. So it's a little bit of touch and go sort of thing. So first of all, first string on. Sorry if you, you won't be able to see this very well, possibly, possibly. Of course I haven't got my mirror to hand. It's been a really hot day, so I'm kind of sweltering in here at the moment. There we go. Fire on up. I suppose we ought to have the lights lights on, really. Right. Uh, right. So, I say junk strings, but so that they've done most of the leveling. Um, we might it might still need a little bit of fine tuning, but I think. Mostly it's good. So I'm just really putting these on just to load the neck and check the geometry more than anything else. Okay, oh, up on there. Um, I mean, I don't have necessarily, may not have to put all of them on. Now, the, the only slight downside of this uh, setup. Oh, what the hell happened there? I don't know, something came undone. The only slight downside is 
that um, I'm trying to work over the top of this polythene that I've put in this pocket. And if I cut it off right now, the problem is it's going to make things very difficult. Now, I may have to shim this, this neck, uh, this, hmm, what's going on here? Have I got the right height? It's about, just about right. Okay, let's get, let's get all of them on and just have a, have a feel, see what's going on. Now it, it is, it could be the shim is fractionally high because I used a piece of copper. So if that's too much, then we can always drop back down. Um, but the good thing about the tunematic bridge is that we've got plenty of room to raise it up. And then the only issue it causes if you raise the tunematic bridge up is you've just got to make, thank you Cavs. You just have to make sure that your um, pickups reach up to the strings. Um, shouldn't be a problem with some new Wilkinsons but we don't want to we don't necessarily want to just shove the, the whole thing too high up if it doesn't need it so I think just having a look at this we might want to go back to um, might need to go back to a thinner shim and then the only downside about that is this is just about right we might have to um, reduce this if we lower the bridge Let's see. I mean, there's nothing wrong with using the height that you've got with the tunematic bridge anyway. So I'm, I'm just really looking for a shim that's going to sit sit firmly in the resin mm, bath that I'm making, or I'm going to be making, to fix this completely knackered pocket. So I'm just getting these hooked up. Now we know that because I've changed the bridge to a 52 and a half inch from half inch, 52 and a half millimeters from um, the original 50 for these kinds of guitars, um, it means that the stop bar is just slightly narrower than the new bridge spacing. So the strings sort of come in a little bit, um, sorry, spread out a little bit from the stop bar to the bridge but it's hardly enough to really notice. The, uh, the, the neck, uh, the nut slot is fairly deep, so I was, I was wondering whether I need to shim the, uh, the, the nut even more, because at the moment it's on one of Gerard's tallest bases, but it may actually not be tall enough, in which case we may have to add a piece of, another piece of 3D nut straight to the bottom and then sand it back to give us the excess. It's perfectly, perfectly, perfectly feasible. Okay, so alignment wise, um, this sits a little bit. Let's have a quick look. Mm -hmm. Not too bad. Okay, height wise, not too bad either. Um, I'm sort of guessing a bit over the top here because I've got this polythene in the way. So let's just take it down a little bit. Let's try and put oh, Christ, I hate these strings. Look at that junk. <laughs> Waste of space. Some bloke trying to tell me on on YouTube that these aren't fake, that they're. They're just um, old Ernie Ball strings. Utter bollocks. That just broke at the ball. So now I've got to find me a, what am I looking for? A G. Oh, sorry, rude words, but. Come on, somebody give me a G. I suppose I've got a G kicking around here. What's in here? 52, 13. What's a G in 17 normally, isn't it? I don't know. There you go. 17. Absolute garbage. So yeah, there you go. Very good 
proof that it's uh, that these aren't old Ernie balls. So I have to I kind of suspect that the person commenting about this is in fact somebody trying to sell these things. Um, the scammer themselves. Because this is... That, that just completely came apart. So whether or not I'll be able to actually do these up without them breaking is another matter. Now it's going to sound terrible because I've basically got this plastic in the way and the plastic is there to protect the heel. Uh, I think we may be too high, so it's not too bad. I think the, I guess what it means is that the shim is in a reasonable position here. Let's get you looking down there for a minute. Shim is in a reasonable, reasonable position. So I'm just going to check how much we can see. Okay, that's pretty high still, so that ain't bad at all. There we go. Yeah, that's all right then. Not not anywhere near as extreme as I thought. It's good on the treble side, roughly. Yeah, about good on the thingy side. No, it's just going to struggle to play, but. play but I'm trying <laughs> now roughly okay looking at this now that's fine that's fine that's fine I'm happy with that with the shim in place Okay, so the whole point of doing that was just to give me a sense that the geometry of this neck with the, that shim fitted is good. So now we go back in time, take the strings off. Um, also, the first fret action is just about right. It would, couldn't go any lower, so or sorry, higher, so uh, we'd have to shim it a bit if it did, but it's, as it happens, it's okay. So these strings are pretty grim. I'm not sure really I want to keep them, but they wouldn't be bad for fret leveling, I suppose. But let's see if we can successfully get them all off. Just fight again. Uh. So I've um, planned for tonight was to do this, um, do the neck pocket, um, get as far as I have with the neck on this one and JT's, which is cool. And then after that, I've got some sanding to do on the Trekkie number six over there. I'm just going to take these out of the way. So 
Now the bit fun bit is we take this all off again. And so this is really about getting the basics right. Um, we've got nice new frets on, they've been leveled. Um, but the, the really important bit now is making sure that the, the basic geometry of this neck works with this body. And as you, you could probably see that this sort of, when you screw it all down, this works. It hangs together okay, but I don't like this big hole here. So my plan is to get a load of um, resin into there. And once I've got the resin into there, I'm going to push the neck back in there. Uh, the heel and then we're going to expect a load of resin to come out the bottom there and I could actually just basically just clamp it in place it doesn't need to be screwed down even actually when I think about it so as long as we've got ourselves a, uh, a clamp that can hold it in place and just hold it enough to squeeze down. Possibly should have done it with the frets off, he said, but I can put a core on there to protect it as well. Um, just hold on for a second. Just give myself a bit of covering. All right, so I'll put the copper shim back where it was. That's right up against the or well, nearly against the back wall, that way around, centrally. So, like I said, the challenge now, we know that when we, I don't know what you can see, we know that, um, that when we look in here like this, we can see it goes, it's actually not bad, it goes up, well, it's bad. It goes up a straight edge here, nice and flat, and then there's a big gap at the back here where all this wood's been torn out. As it happens, it just just about comes up to meet that shim there. And we might find that that shim actually isn't even quite touching the back of the heel, but that's okay because we'll, we'll make up some stuff to fill it in. So there are not a lot of goes at this. Um, you get it on, you screw it on if you want with one, or you clamp it on, whichever feel is the right thing. This is a 9.5 millimeter, no, 9.5 inch radius block. So we could use a big clamp and a block to um, hold the neck on there and allow all the stuff to squeeze out through the holes. Because we don't mind if these holes get filled up with stuff. What we don't want is we don't want the, more than anything, we don't want the neck screws getting stuck in there, which uh, is not a good thing. So if we're going to use this stuff. Um, let's be ready with the clamp and the thing. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll there goes my little hex key. When um, when we get the stuff in there, we'll put this in here like this and we'll clamp on top like that and squeeze it together. And then we'll expect uh, how are we going to do it without getting we want this stuff to come out here. Um, how would we do that? Hmm. Let's just think. Think, think, think. So we have that on there. We come to there. If we go to there, it's going to come out the hole. It's going to fill those, but come out. We want most to come out the middle hole. It's got to come out somewhere that we don't cover. That's the important bit. And ideally, it's not really going to come out through there because that's going to be undone. So we could put the force there. Hmm. We may not even need to use that much force. Right. Okay, so let's make up <laughs> the goo. So the, the thing at this point is, is it's a bit of guesswork as to how much we need. And that isn't working at all. We've got a blockage now. Ow. If it's going to 
be difficult, I might end up using a, a different pile. Okay, evens out now. Thank you. There we go. There's our whole lot. Using all that up. Okay, so a quick mix. So I've got plastic on the all around, mostly around um, the heel, and I'm hoping that it's going to mostly protect it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to load this stuff in here. We're basically going to sink or going to trap in case this copper in the resin, if we can. I can quite reach it. Don't want to get it too much out in the way. So it's going to try and go down these holes naturally. Get in there. All the way up to back really more at the back than anywhere else that's the idea okay so there's uh, there's our pile of goo and all the way in there and the copper is now buried nicely in there we'll send the last bit at the top here okay so best we can do is we'll get it up here so that's in line and then we're going to <coughs> squeeze that together we have to do a bit of downward pressing now <laughs> squeeze out some of the goo and you can see it coming out there and that didn't quite work the way I wanted and it's made a bit of a mess I was hoping that would miss the uh, back there. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, attempt to just, I'm just going to hold that if I can in place like that for a minute. Okay, that may not be ideal but I think it will have to do for a minute. I'm going to just leave that standing. Is it going to? No. Nope. I just want to get some. That's not going to work either. <laughs> Stay there. No. Nope. That's a problem. So I can't. I can't place this anywhere except back down this way. Stay there. Now I just need a bit of uh, solvent. Right. So I'm put that under a little bit more pressure. Really, it doesn't need to be hugely pressured. It just needs to be pressed down on there. And I should have put paper, um, green tape further. Just wipe that off there. Right. That's good. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Okay, so there we have that squeezed flat, and with a bit of luck, we should have the gaps filled as much as it needs to, so that we can, when it's set, we can just remove that, um, scrape off the excess, or chip off any excess, and then we'll be hopefully have a solid more solid joint 
if it comes up there, comes out the back. It's going off already. It's so warm. Um, it's not going to take too long to go. So, right. Let's prod it with some cocktail sticks to see the progress. So we've got it a bit squelched out the back, which we expected. Oh, sorry, it's not a very good view all around, is it? So we've got some on the back there, which we don't mind because we can clean that off. We can polish this up. Um, that's good. That's good. So really, this only probably only needs uh, a few minutes of this. We could potentially um, remove this now. <laughs> it's sticky on there, and I'm not going to. I'm going to fit the um, plate just this second because it's got some goo in there. So we will need to drill out some. But actually, it's all it's all looking stable as it should be. So just that there, we'll have to clean up afterwards. But it's all it's all okay. This green stuff is um, invaluable, really. There's so many uh, kinds of tape that just don't do what this does. This is absolutely vital. So you can see it's completely masked off that square there, exactly as we wanted. set. Ah, right, so there we are. That probably just needs to be stood up or something. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now what theoretically what we could should be able to do at this point is remove the neck from this plastic shroud. Um, and it should come away <laughs> cleanly. Yeah. Not bad. Oops, got the sticky stuff there. Okay, let me let me uh, show you up close. It's nearly right. Da -da, up close. It's nearly there. It's improved it. It's, it's, a it's got a couple of little dips and stuff but m around the hole, but mostly it's filled in the gap, which is perfect. So that's what I was aiming to do, fill in the air gap. Hurrah! What can you see? Right, so let's tidy up this, get rid of this sticky stuff. I think it'll soon be time for a cup of tea. So what I'll do is I'll let this dry and then I'm going to drill through the holes to, to free up the holes again. And as you can see this will just all pull out when it's dry. So let's do like in the cookery programs, let's st stick it over here. Let's put this back. Um, this glued, uh, everything glued, fretted, um, frets levelled. So that's ready for the precision fret levelling. Um, nut is on. so kind of moving forward with that, which is great. So that's, a, that's the end of, well, that's as far as what I wanted to do with this today. So I'm going to stop, have a cup of tea, and um, take care of something else that isn't this one. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow for the next section of this, which will be uh, probably painting 
conductive paint, cleaning up the body, conductive paint, um, and things like that. Okay, so thanks for watching. See you shortly. Well, here we are back on Dave's um, Les Paul and Hondo 2 Les Paul. So we've got new frets on, we've got um, adjustable nut, and I've string, stringed it up with a new bridge just to get a feel for the playability and the action on it. So the thing that's struck me about it straight away is how remarkably um, resonant it is as a guitar. I mean, that's sort of not necessarily what you want in a guitar, although some people think it is, but it's a lot of acoustic noise coming out. Pretty good, actually. I'm sure that's the frets, but might just be a bit of fret slap. I think what I'll do is I'm going to give it one more quick going over. Um, this is the part which I want to just get the basic playability spot on. Um, so ah, it's got me pinch my finger. So while we've got everything straight up, straight up, set up and under tension, I'm going to use this opportunity to level it out. But I'm really going to just focus on the bottom two strings there because there's just a little bit of room required for those strings to spin a bit better. And once that's done the neck part of it will be done and we can move on to cleaning up the body and then fitting the new hardware and wiring everything up so it's funny because I had um I wasn't intending to do this well I was intending to do this but the thing I had intended to do first tonight I forgot to bring the guitar up I was going to fit a boost to a guitar Got the guitar from upstairs in the spare room, put it in a bag, and then left it behind as I came up. So, a bit foolish, really. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I'll have to do that another day, because I couldn't face it. I mean, it's only five minutes each way, but I just, you know, when you're, you're sort of in the mood to just get going, and you don't want to retrace your steps all the way back. Anyway, so I got on and did something else, which was, to make a solid brass headpiece for Trekkie 9. Mm -hmm. So some of the whatever's rattling in here, there's a bit of there's a bit of sort of wood buzz in there. Very difficult to pin down unfortunately. Um, that brand new fresh truss rod. Uh, yeah, difficult difficult to pin down. Um, I'm hoping it will kind of stop when I've refitted or fitted all the correct bits of hardware and stuff, but you never know. So I'm just going to whiz over the high strings and then get sort of stuck in I'm using this um, rod here, the, the Stumac thingamajig it's called, U-channel. Uh, the reason I'm using this one in this case is because I want, I want to clear some, clear out some uh, string spin space and the U-channel is really good for that because it stays stiff and that's what you actually need for creating the string, I suppose, the relief space that your your uh, strings need. Now, of course, the funny part is, you know that relief is created by putting a, a curvature in the neck. That's absolutely true. However, it's also, um, 
Move this microphone. Mm -hmm. It's also added to or helped by creating, um, a s a smoothing out the uneven frets that you'll find on the neck. So even though, even though your uh, neck has a curve in it, which is fine, you need that. What you'll find is within that, when it's under load, the, s the curve won't actually be perfectly smooth, uh, and you. And so, sometimes you find that the the sort of unevenness of it can take away the, um, the clearance you need to play. So. Fine. Um, and that, that can sometimes just only just shows up on the uh, low strings because they move more because they're bigger and relatively speaking less um, tight pound for pound. Oh, I don't know. They're a little less under less. They're thicker. They seem like they, they've got a less tense so they get less stiff so they get more chance to move whatever the word I'm looking for is. Anyway, um, so they tend to move more anyway and so you need that to be particularly precise that relief clearance room for the strings to move so what i'm just doing here is just using the shape of the truss rod the curve on the truss rod just to e eke out the curve in the neck so that the strings will spin without striking the frets Perfectly. I uh, forgot that I've got another set of fretting to do, and that's for um, Beach's trekking number nine. I just set that up just now, basically to make sure the bridge, get the bridge positioned right, um, map the new as fitted um, center line, the neck center line onto the body. Uh, so that was successful. So that's what I did instead of the one I had planned to do. So I'm didn't, I didn't um, waste the time. So this, this in a way should come together pretty quickly after this. Just want to get the, uh, the frets as good as they can be. There's quite a lot of dust coming off there, but that's that's fine. Uh, if you remember, I did a leveling with the strings off. That was the radius block leveling and um, the great thing about the radius block leveling is it's good but the neck isn't under load so when you put the neck under load uh, everything changes very slightly and the frets kind of bunch up a little bit um, which is why I still think it's if you want to be perfectly accurate you, or as accurate as you can be you definitely want to do a, a strong leveling with the banana tool like I'm doing right now. You definitely want to do that. Now this this here, I'm hoping this A and E is now really what I want to clean up the fret slap from where it was. So I'm really hoping the curve on this rod is going to impose itself where it needs to. Looks like it is. So we'll get rid of that one. It's good. So last one to tidy up. So I, I only realized the power of that tool to do this particular part. So this leveling right now isn't about high frets because I took care of all of those when I did the radius block leveling. What this is about now is about ironing out the crumpled neck that we've got as a result of loading it with the string loading. So, so I'm going to come to the edge of this now and I'm going to let this tool scoop out the space it needs to clear up the low E. Out the way, yeah. Right, 
Okay, I think that's the right. Oh yeah. Right, well it's a little bit of um, slap, but then again, we are probably on extremely low action if I just double check this. Well, we're on point 1.5. Let's check the relief in the neck. That's practically flat. <laughs> so let's slack that off a little bit. Um, see if we have any give in the in the neck. Now we're we're at so we're at the we're at the most. Uh, slack we're going to get it the most curved so we've got a, a slight limitation plays so it, it plays really well the only limitation is it's got a little bit of um, fret buzz or slap I would call it not fret buzz sorry um, and I'm really thinking that the neck is just a fraction too flat for my liking so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and just put a little bit more curve or space into this uh, low E track in the hope that we can just solve that over slightly too flat neck problem. Um, this is you know a problem that we've got really due to the old neck. Um, nothing we can really do about it. Um, when I adjusted it, it adjusted in the, the right direction as in it tightened up first but what it isn't doing is going any further in the slack department. Now this could be solved by heavier strings and I can't remember what we started out with. Um, Many would say that's brilliant, but I'm just I'm just conscious of that tiny little bit of slap that we can't undo. Um, we've got no more undoingness. The problem with the, that is this is a one-way truss rod, and it won't it won't uh, go the opposite direction to put a curve into it. Um, the only way we would change that is to put heavier strings on. Um, so we'll check with what Dave's preferred gauge is. I can't remember what we said, but these are currently nines. But if it's um, if it's preferred gauges heavier, then we might get a little bit more pull out of it. But it is limited by that being an old, an old beastie. But, but it plays great. I mean, there's absolutely no no problem rocking out on that.
way around that maybe to just slightly raise this. Where did the thing go? Good. It's got a little bit of um, a little bit of sanding, gentle sanding needing there. That's where the edge is that I glued. Um, okay. I mean I'm, that plays pretty well. Filthy. What did I just do with the? That's amazing. The noisy thing. I must have hung it back up without. Yeah, I did. Put it up here without realizing it. Okay. So that's good for now. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to take off. The strings I'm going to polish all these frets out then I'm going to clean the guitar up overall um, and get it ready for fitting the new hardware in which I'll come back and show you Sorry. Um, well let's just keep running us right we're we're fret leveled so let's get all this old these strings out So you can see that, that currently the board looks very dry because it's had all the oil from years of fingers taken out of it. So we'll we'll add regularly add some more oil into this, a couple of glugs of oil before it goes gets ready to go out the door. Um, okay, this one come off. Cut of the strings. I think one of the one of the things I would like to have, if I could, is a, some sort of machine that does a, a very much finer re-radius than a um, oh God, I just dropped the strings on the floor. Much finer re-radius than using a, um, either a block or, um, in some cases, a, a routing jig, which I think is. I can't get these strings, <laughs> which is pretty hungry in terms of um, material. So I'm sort of, I don't like the idea of, God, I keep dropping strings. don't like the idea of putting a, a router on there. Well, I have done it from scratch with a, with a piece of, you know, a fretboard that needs, um, you know, a square slab of fretboard. It's good for that. But... Um, yeah, some sort of, I don't know, some sort of really, really light jig with a very gentle refinishing, precise fingerboard thing would be good. Don't quite know what that would look like. Um, I mean, that hmm, wouldn't be a plane, would it? You couldn't really get a plane that did that. Okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm going to, um, I'm going to go the medium side. And I'm going to just recrown these frets. Affecting a bit more work on this base side because I put a bit more leveling into that. And then it'll be a case of um, polishing it out. Look what that is. Is that a person? Or a creature? Creature. Creature in the roof space. So, to go back now and look at my to-do list and <laughs> I 
think it's a bird. It could be some other kind of creature. There is a cat out there in the courtyard of this site. I presume he's the local rat catcher, but Unfortunately, I don't think he gets up as far as the uh, roof space. Okay, so we're nearly done with this. Now, the problem, just for now, what, what I'll do is when I polish these out tonight, um, sanded and polished them out, what I'm going to do is put some oil on them then. But, um, that will soak in pretty thoroughly by the time I get ready, get done with all the other things and get ready to um, finish the guitar. So it would be sort of a matter of um, finding every chance now to put some oil on it because it's old and mucky. So first of all, let's get some of the dust off here, which is built up. Don't worry about the action on here. Um, we'll take care of that later. Because we can go back to whatever action we want. Now we've got the frets done. Um, these have got the original bushes, so I've used the original posts as well. And they're a bit mangled at the top, but it's better than trying to pull out the uh, original bushes, because, because they're made of or they're, they're fitted into plywood. I don't want to run any risk of the plywood splitting and making a mess. So I'm going to stick with these original ones. Um, it, it's not, you know, this it's not a it's not a case queen looker of a guitar. This is a, a playing guitar. Okay, now at this point, I'm just I'm wiping off all the dust and some of the pen, leftover pen, and it's mainly to make sure that when I tape this up next, I'm able to um, get the tape to stick to it effectively so I can do all the leveling, not leveling, polishing, sanding and polishing out. There we go. So again, this is one more moment of taking grime out of the, out of the board so it'll, it'll really be dry now. And that's fine. What I'll do is now, I'm going to ma uh, mask this off I will take care of the polishing, sanding and polishing out, and then come back when I'm ready to put the components and everything back in. Should be tonight, I think. We'll see you in a minute. Well, <laughs> I'm just about to, well, I was just about to get started on the Hondo 2 when I realized that when I was vacuuming, vacuuming, up the work surface today, something went into the what's it went into the Henry and guess what that something happened to be it happened to be yes you've got it the blasted adjustable nut that I made um, which means I'm going to have to put the contents of Henry on the floor or slit his, slit his guts and try and find it uh, which in some ways you could say it's not the worst thing in the world because I think Henry has probably swallowed a few other things that I should have dug out before now. However, this is going to be an ungodly mess. <laughs> no, no, please no, don't. Come along now, let's find all the good things. Oh well. No, 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 no. A pencil, I knew I lost that. <laughs> I guess I'm going to have to, well, theoretically, I could try and find it like this. But if I can't, then I'm going to have to tip it all out. If it's not in there, then where is it? 
And I have a few others I can pull apart. I mean, I can undo a new one. Well, this is not massively encouraging because, as far as I can tell, it's not there. The problem is, how will you know? <laughs> oh, really? Do you really want to be doing this? If not there, where the hell did it go? Because, I mean, this could take me quite some time to dig it out, but if it isn't there, oh, I don't, it couldn't have fallen behind there, could it? Is it that small? Oh, that would be ridiculous. Not in there, not tucked up in there. Not in these bits, not in these bits. <sighs> well, it's 12 quid's worth of stuff, so I've got to try and find it. some bits in here but they're more bits of wood than anything <laughs> no 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 don't fall over there's a piece of a, a knackered old jack socket in there Come along. I'm, all, I'm missing quite a few little important things, like um, such as yeah, there's there's a uh, the little thing that undoes the chuck on the proxy Dremel thing that Big Stevie gave me. Trying to just dig out the obvious bits. That's a piece of top of some resin containers. Some strings. It's almost exclusively sawdust from the day, well, from the routing session I had yesterday, day before. No, no, no. Well, shiver me timbers, land lovers. Got a horrible feeling. This darn thing ain't there. Piece of wood. About the right size. Fret. A black nut. That could have been what went off the shelf. And a piece of splinter of wood. Piece of wood, paper, wood, paper, scissors. I think we've pretty much got everything. Mm. 
I think that's a no. Uh, right. Which still leaves me with something of a conundrum. What did I do with it? And the answer is, I don't know. Come on. Well, okay. I accept defeat. At least on that subject. So, the fact is, I've got to find one. Because the problem is, is that one has already been tailored for the job. So, get, finding another one is going to be a bit of a pain. We're getting another one. Sorry, I've got, I've got plenty of them. That's knackered. Right. Okay. So that's a bit that it could have been. What I'm worried about now is if it's down the back here, I've got zero access to it. That's really not very encouraging. Let's see if I can poke something in there. It would be funny if there are things in there that need to come out. No sound or anything. It did go in there. It's anyone's guess because it's not there right now. Nothing stuck to the wall. There's nothing over there. There is another one there, but it's not the one I'm after. Uh, the only other place it might live is on here, which sometimes things get put on there for good safekeeping. And it ain't on there neither. Well, I think I can safely say, in my clumsiness, I have, I'm getting boiled, I have mislaid it. Ah, uh, do you know what? Hang on, here's me getting off. Where would you put it? Would you put it in the old stuff, Sam, or in the new stuff? You'd put it in the new stuff, wouldn't you? Yes. Oh, well, that was fun. <laughs> well, good, you know, save a few quid, like, innit? Right, okay, so there are some things we're going to need to rescue out of here. So there's the rhythm treble thing, there's that, there's the knobs, cool, there's the plastics, cool. We'll keep those out, give them a little clean if we can. Those are leftovers, those are all leftovers. The jack socket, we'll keep it, but we'll, get, we'll replace the jack. We've got a new set of wiring, but I bought new pots and everything here. This is a sort of no different from what came out. So, so let's put all of that into there, out of the way. I'll put that there just in case. Uh, we've got the strap buttons here. We've got, we'll keep the tip of the thing in case. We'll find the... Uh, that doesn't belong with this guitar, that belongs with another guitar. Now I'm going to sneeze, oh my goodness. <coughs> Excuse me! Oh, hellfire. That's, that's Henry the Hoover's fault, I tell you. It's a whale of a tale, I tell you. I'll, I'll get copyright for that too. Sorry, I'll pick you back up in a second. This. Sorry, this is just slightly annoying. So I put all that back in there, and what I suddenly realized is there are some little screws here that are original 
and they have the sort of you know, style of the guitar. Now, they won't work unless we fill the holes because they're all worn out. But if I can just separate them out from to rest, we have got an original set of all of these little things. If we can now, the other thing about this is, is we've got these pickup covers are broken. The other ones that came with the new pickups are cream, but I think we'll go with those since the other ones are broken. It seems silly to put cracked ones back on when we've got perfectly good new ones. And since the binding and everything is in cream anyway, so how about we do that? Yes, I agree. And we'll use we'll use different. That wasn't useful. Uh, we'll use different screws as well. So I'll keep these out. Uh, let's put these back on my ear, which kind of keeps everything boiled as well. Sorry about this. Right, and then we tip out the rest of the goodies. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, so what we're going to do? We're going to first of all, we're going to check the <laughs> what fell off now. Oh, it's one of these ferrules. They don't bloody stay in, do they? Oh. Pants. <laughs> right, this, this is... <laughs> Thankfully, my box of bits caught it. Right, so this doesn't stay in. Yeah, that's the problem with these old things. They, the only way you'd get them in is with a bit of resin. Um, or wood glue maybe, but you know neither really do you want to put in here if you could get away with it. But it's not going to stay in unless we do that. So thinks to himself. All right, the first thing let's let's have a plan of action. So we've got our new pickups here. We've got to um, check. Now if I tip this upside down, that's going to fall out again. If I get glue on this, it's going to make. A mess. The only glue I could comfortably put in here would be some wood glue. But let's let's do something because this is this is not really great. So the, one of the problems with these old guitars, um, one of the challenges is everything's worn out. So if I take these tuners off, I don't know what you can see here. Sorry, I'm really really not paying attention to your viewing pleasure. If you take off the, old, the tunes like this, what you'll realise straight away is all the holes that, you, that the screws sit in are knackered. So I think while I'm doing this, let's let's just plod through this methodically. Let's take these off. Let's fill all these holes one more time, and we'll re-drill some pilot holes in the same place, but just we'll let the screws bite into a bit of fresh wood um, because otherwise these things will just rattle and come loose, and it's just annoying. So. We're going to improve this thing, and we, we can do as many improvements as we can find to do that's within our scope of capability. So, again, this is, although these have already been off once, we'll, we'll do them again. Meanwhile, while we've got it on its front, we can also then check the space required for the larger pots. So we just want to make sure that there's room to fit them in without having to do too many adjustments so the filling of um, original screw holes we can do everywhere and it would benefit us to do everywhere and, and I tend to look to f fill them with usually with um, toothpick that's not a good one toothpick style uh, bits of wood but in the case of some of these little ones oh sorry there's some of these bigger ones like the tuna screw holes here. Some of them are so um, wide now that they would really benefit from uh, benefit from filling and redoing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push out these ferrules again and even though some of them are quite stiff um, they're mainly stiff because they, they, they're biting onto a load of uh, stuff in the in the, the holes, um, basically buffing compounds from when it was finally buffed. 
So I'm just going to try and gently, uh, you can see it's digging out some of that buffing compound now. So I'm just going to sort of scrape away some of the loose buffing compound on both sides. Not the ideal tool in some ways because it's, it's tapered. So we aren't going to get as much out of that as I'd like. But it will just allow me to clean it a little bit. I'm not doing much. Um, just so we can get a bit of glue to bite into something. I mean, now we've taken these out, we could do this with <laughs> resin. The only problem with resin is it's, it's mucky. If we get wood glue on here, it's no big thing because we can clean that up all around. <laughs> and also these, these little um, ferrules are clogged up as well. Okay. So I think I'll, I'll just leave them for now. We'll come back. But what I'll concentrate on is, well, we got this this way up. We'll take care of this, the holes here. If we can get that done with toothpick-sized bits of wood or thickness wood, then that's fine. Let's just do a little test. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, we'll do it with that. So give me some glue. And... Post it note. It's my temporary glue platform. And I'll use one end of the. I don't know what you can see. Can you see there? Can you see there? Yeah. I'll do one end, the sharp end, to chuck some glue in there first. Again, because it's water soluble glue, it's great because you can you really chuck it on here to make sure it gets everywhere you want it to. Um, and then you can take it out or clean up, um, I should say, without any problem at all. And you end up with a nice clean finish, but your bits of wood perfectly stuck in place. And we can do this all over the place in a minute for all the bits that need filling in. So what I would tend to do with this is I would tend to cut off, normally I take three or four of these, cut them halfway down, holding on to the ends, then I would cut off most of the sharp bit, because we only need a bit of taper, then I'd dip the tapered end in to the glue, and I would tap it in over all, all the excess glue that I've got here. holding the headstock while I do it because I don't want to whack it too hard. It doesn't really need much taking off. I only took a little bit off to sort of create a, a, a little bit of a taper, I suppose. So, because it, it seems to be just about the right size. So again, just tapering these. You can see there's quite a, a few to do. Tap them in. I've got so many pictures of me doing this, it's unreal. Now this one, I've got to be a little careful because it's on the crack that was already in the headstock. So I get these, cut them down the middle. Cut the sharp bits off. I mean, if we want to be quick, I mean, just push them in as long as we remember which ones we didn't tap yet. Anyway, so, yes, good to be getting stuck in. I've got more to do tomorrow. All right, we're there. <laughs> Here's me cutting three and we're down to the last one. Okay, so the next thing we do is get some tissue kitchen roll. I have a feeling I hope Claire got the hammock in from outside. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now just snip off the uh, excess and, it, and I want to snip it off just slightly proud of the surface so I'm not I'm not trying to get it dead flush at this point. I want a nice just a, you know half a millimeter above the surface or just sort of how these pliers work really. Um, they're not 
dead flush, which is good. Then what I tend to do then is give everything a little clean. If you say, for example, that you've got stuff all over it now, what you have to do is get yourself a wet cloth, damp cloth, I should say, rather than wet, and then you can whiz that over the surface. That softens all the wood glue up again, and then before you know it, look at that, all cleaned up. So all that's left now is a little bit of the wood above the surface and for that I get me a fresh very sharp blade and how oh it slid down the pole my friends let's see what you can see yeah there you go um, I get me a very sharp blade and I'm bending the blade to just keep a little area where it's cutting so I'm not I'm not at risk of cutting either side. It's bending so I can just get it to bite on the, the wood that I want to cut. And it's got to be very sharp for that and you've got to be confident handling the blade so you don't chop your own fingers to bits. It's something which I do quite regularly but never terminally. So it's, uh, it's one of those things that uh, people who do this sort of thing uh, and like to use a particular technique even though it has some risks we sort of tend to swear by it, even though we know it's scary looking. Um, if you've read my other new ebook, you'll know how much I rely on these kind of blades for all manner of things. Um, with loads of little scars as a result of it, but I still couldn't live without them. Okay, so there's nice smooth what's it. Now, at this point in time, what I'm going to also do is I'm going to use um, no, I'm not going to do it at that end. Let's come down here. Come, come with me. Come with me and you'll see. Oh, no, I'll get sued for that as well. In a world of your imagination. Tell where I grew up. Or when I grew up. Well, no, <laughs> you can tell that I haven't grown up. But when I grew up, where I should have grown up was in the 70s. Okay, so here we have our new pots, which are nice full-size ones. Now, you drop them in there and they look, looks like they'll fit. I'm going to tip the nuts and bolts off to one side so we can use them. As always, there's not enough, well, for my liking, there's not enough nuts. But these are just about fitting okay without any need for extra work. Um, with a, there you go, with a, now as you know we've put in a load of, what's that stuff, it's called shielding paint and because of that uh, it means that the cavity here is grounded, oh sorry it will be grounded and it means that the cavity paint therefore has the possibility of um, grounding out anything that touches it. So with something like this, it really does help, providing these go all the way through and you've got enough room, which according to this I do, you'd sort of really want uh, a nut on the inside of here. And the reason for that, if I can borrow some of the old ones, have I kept them? Let's see if they fit. The reason for that is, is it helps to lift them up off the uh, that finish, that um, shielding. So if I put a, an old nut on there um, and then we put it back in here, we should be able to get it all the way through with just enough, that's right. And it keeps it that little bit higher because what I want, more, more than anything, I want these lugs not to run the risk of grounding out. Now if I'm really nervous about that, what I can do is I can put some tape down inside there as well. That's not a bad option um, as a sort of Safeguard. Come on, man. Where are you? Come on, I need you. Thank you. But for starters, I'll just make sure every one of these has got a. Oh, I'm boiling now. I shouldn't have had that cup of tea, should I? On top of the humidity. 
I'm going to go and look in a minute and see what the um, primer looks like on my uh, Trekkie 6 spray, respray thing. Okay, now there's the other one, hiding from me in plain sight. Okay, so what I've got to do in this is I've got to make, make up some wiring for the switch. I've got to decide how my wiring works. So it shouldn't be that complicated, really. It's only a less ball. So here's my new switch and it's things. Now, um, because it's, we've got, it's, 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 it's got black tip, but we've got black trimmings. So let's try and see if this cream tip would fit this. Sorry about this, the view's gone funny. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit tight, but you know what? It's better than a poke in the eye. I think that will fit. In fact, it's so well fitted, I don't think it'll ever come off. There you go. So what we're going to do is we're going to pop that in there, facing that way. And then we're going to run our set of cables through the body out the other side. Now, typically, um, on a Les Paul style guitar, that likes to be a vintage, well, it likes to be, they like to use um, braided wire. But, and there's only, there's only considerations are thus. You've got to get three things up there. All right? So you've got, um, you've got the two, excuse me, you've got the two, um, the left and the right signal, and you've got the return that goes back out. Um, now, people do this in different ways. Um, some people like to run the pickups to the pots first, pot out to the switch, and then the switch goes straight out to the jack. That sort of makes the most sense. Um, technically, you could run it so that the pickups actually went to the switch, the output from the switch, no, you couldn't do that, could you? <laughs> no, so it's, but there, there are a couple of ways of wiring it. Some people have, um, some people ground the back of the um, three-way switch, which I never particularly do, unless there's a distinct reason for it. Now, in this case, as long as everything's grounded, the switch itself doesn't need to be grounded. Um, it's got a bit of metal sticking out, touching, yeah. That's an interesting quite does it some people ground it but but it's it's not strictly necessary i suppose i suppose it you got two three got three live wires you've got to get here and you could do it with three lengths of this stuff um, and then you've got the braid which could all be a ground which comes back and out to there. Sorry, I'm thinking aloud. The alternative, I mean, one way or other, you're going to run three wires through there. The reason why people like this stuff through a, a Les Paul body is because the if you ground the sheath here, um, and and that if 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 the sheath is grounded, the wire braid is grounded then um, what it does is it theoretically helps, along with the paint, it helps to um, stop in unwanted radio frequencies getting in to the signal wire that's going through the middle of it. Um, also, if you do ground this to the back of the uh, switch, you can use this grounding to run a little extra wire off there into this little cavity with a little lug. Sorry, you can't see that. You can go into the, uh, from, from the back of the switch just hook the back of the switch to the cavity, um, which then it will then make this into a Faraday cage as well. So you've got lots of options. Um, but like I say, you've got three. You've got to get three hot wires, and that means three lengths of this cable running together. So it's not impossible. Um, it's I suppose it's if anything, it's just quite a lot of material. But heck, who cares? So I've got quite a lot of this stuff. Um, let's pick three lengths of the same. 
So we'll go on the basis that we'll use this because we like the idea of it um, shielding the uh, extra shielding, and we'll join it. We'll join it up to the switch as well. So the switch will be grounded, and in, in, in partly so that we can take a bit off to that cavity. So there will be our three. These will come all the way through the body. Um, some people have little clips that they join these up with and then they solder them together because that's quite good to solder these together in a lump here. But don't forget, we first of all, we've got to get our wires out so we can strip some of this back and use a bit of the pushback function. But we need to, we need to get, we need to stop the ground cable there and we need to get the other bits round to the front, round to the lugs of this switch. So we need kind of like that. So what would we call that? Two centimeters of extra, or two centimeters of wire sticking through. And of course these are, these are all the same color wire, so you can't really tell which is which. So you have to be very careful about labeling things up um, while you're doing the, putting it all together. So rather than, I bought a ton of these little, things I ran out of these the other day so I've now got billions of these so we couldn't we could actually kick off with one of these a couple of these coming into play here um, just for the sake of locking this together so let's why don't we go purple I mean like I say the, the metal ones are quite good but um, and then you sort of they're, they're designed for you to clip and solder as well so that's quite handy but okay got the wrong bit got the right bit no short bit right okay so what I'm going to do here let's see if I can zoom out now are we zoomed out yeah I'm going to I'm going to tie or to cable tie these I'm making this bit up I haven't done it quite this way before so I'm gonna just tie these together going to attempt to tie these together. So there you go. You get them in a straightish line like that. Truth is you won't get them to stay in a straight line. Okay. So there's my business end of that and down to the business end. Now it doesn't hurt if I just keep this together. We could, I think people do, they, I think they do a little wrapping with some wire. That's what they do. That's what they do. Now I think of it. Now, the only thing we've got to be sure to do before we wrap all this off is let's get some markings on here. So let's try some different colors. Let's have a green, let's have a blue, and let's have a red. So we know what's what. So we go red here. So red, just behind there. Not very, not exactly the richest colour I've ever seen sticking to something. And then we'll track this red. Maybe there's a better way of doing this. What do you think? Red down to this end. It's not like it's a permanent marker, is it? Is it going to come off? Yeah, mainly. Damn. <laughs> uh, so if you get when you get permanent markers, then you have to use color special codes. Let's do some special codes. Uh, right now, where has it gone? Okay, let's do that again. Right. So what should we call it? One, two, and three dots. Okay. So this is one. This is one. And red is now one. One blob of permanent marker. Very good. So even that doesn't bloody last long. Okay, now let's do two. Two blobs of permanent marker. Mm -hmm. 
be nice if they actually made this braided wire in different colours. Anodized colours or something. Okay, there's me there's me two blobs down to this end. Two blobs. Mm -hmm. And finally, three blobs. One, two, three. Nothing worse than getting things the wrong way around when you're threading wires through invisible tunnels. So it pays to sort of set these up in a way that you're going to remember where things are. Doesn't matter which one you use for the, um, the different things, but it just matters you know which they are. So you get them in the right order. Okay. So, first thing we'll do is we will run this through a big cavity. This is going to stick up this end, so let's find a way in. These three are loose, so sometimes it helps to put a bit of tape around the end to help things along. That, just to keep them together while they travel. <laughs> well, so they don't go in at all. Right, through you go. Come on. So what we should find at this point is they come out through there and head out into the guitar and then down into there. Now the other thing as well is if the if this what these wires are grounded. They should ground the um, the, fin uh, the paint in here, but again, that sort of depends on how well they touch. But we can always extra ground them. Okay, so there's our stuff coming through there, and here's our bit at that end. We can stick those down. So having got those there, we could relabel them if we're worried that the um, things going to come off, the colours are going to come off. So if you wanted to ground those, if we know that this is going to be grounded, we could put a little screwed lug in here and we could solder this braided cable um, just lightly to the thing there. And to do that we could get some raw wire from the middle of a piece of vintage pushback wire or something. I don't use this anymore. I tend to use the um, Let's put my soldering iron on for a minute. I tend to use um, the what's the stuff called? Oh god, it's rubber. Silicon, anyway. So what we can do is we can um, if we if we want to tie these up we could we could have used this stuff, but I'm not sure what we're gonna do. Yeah, hmm. Okay, let's take a bit off and do a, a version of it. Because this way we can leave a little bit sticking off the thing to solder to. So actually, this is not a bad thing. We could pull that to there and go, there's the solder point there. And then we could do the same here. Solder point there. And then we could, we could run these out again. Have me, have me a bit of wire. Um, tell you what, let's see. Let's see if this will do it. Forgive me a moment. Gently, gently. Right, so let's imagine 
this is the bit we want to solder because now I can wrap this round here and give myself some metal to solder to and then what I can do as well is run a little bit off twist it round here and cut it off but that will give us a little um, lug for soldering I don't know it's just a just a thought we'll do the same with this one and actually we could if we wanted to be vintagey styly we could take away this um, this thing here we could just add add the uh, plier behind it and hold it together old fashionedy style Um, actually, we'd do the same little twist as well coming off there because then that could then stick to the lug in the side of the pocket. So I'm going to be being cheeky and take off this plastic thing now. All right, there's our thing there. Let's take them off. We've got millions of them. Let's use this wire instead. And we'll do this one down here with the last piece. Those will be our three. It'll hold it all together, but it'll also be our three grounding points. These three. One, two, three. Actually, we could do four, couldn't we? We could indeed do four. So, that's cool. So once we've sort of put this together... We've got to be absolutely sure we know which wire is which. I wish I had some coloured something that I could put round them so it was absolutely dead certain. Wow. Dun. Might need a bit more of this wire. Is it here? Yes, it's here. Right on the floor for vacuuming up another time, i.e. later. So this is um, this is preparatory stuff, really. Um, it's it's the kind of stuff that's quite fun if you're not doing it on camera. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It's just sort of fiddly, fiddly little details, getting things ready and so on. Um, if you're doing it on camera, it's a bit more of a pain in the because mm, you're having to think about it and stuff. Okay, let's get rid of these. Um, looking at this, two, one, three. So let's see if I can let's see if I can use these things. It's a bit of a waste, but let me see if I can label use these to kind of tag the colours. Colours of the rainbow. Two. So we go yellow, let's call yellow number one, whatever. Let's put it on here and see if it will make a tight little colour identifier. What I really care is that it stays on. <laughs> Don't mind. It's a bit wasteful in plastic. Okay, that was one down at that end. And then one here is going to be this one. I will put it, let's put it just behind there. No, we can't put it behind. We've got to put it in front because we've got to see it directly. Okay, that's no, that's one, isn't it? There's two, there's three. Right. Number one, on you go. I just don't want it to end up melting. Okay, colours. Let's have some... Let's have two purples and two blues. I say bulky, but... We can cut them off once the things are all in place. It's just a way of keeping track. Okay, purples are twos, for what it's worth. The numbers don't matter, it's just keeping one end the same as the other end, if you get what I mean. Okay. Another 
minus the two. The two is here. Oh well, it's a sort of way of doing it. It, it won't fall off the way a tape would. That's one thing. Two, and finally, the blues. The problem with this is, this is, you'll see how long you've bought your die of boredom watching this, if you're still here, but you'll also see how long this takes in terms of fiddly little bits. Now it might not take other people such a long time, but it takes me, people, this long time. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, in a minute, or out of, no, not out of sight, I could carry your cross. I could carry your cross and... I'm going to need to, first of all, unpick wherever the sharp thing has gone. I'm going to unpick some of this wiring, but I'm going to solder together these bits together, solder together these bits together, and have them ready, and we'll put in some, we'll cut and prepare some lugs to fit in here. Um, so that we can make things hook up. Right, right, right. So, yeah, you can come with me. Oops. Hello, you've come over to my food table. One second, please. A bit unprepared because I didn't necessarily think I was going to zip across here and do this. <laughs> soldering thing is on. Get me soldering arms, me arms. What am I looking at? Where's me? Hello, there. Uh, where's my... Yeah. Okay, something like that. Um, right. Let's solder this thing. Now, I'm not 100% sure that this here iron is the best iron I've got. The best iron in the world. Now, first of all, I've lost the solder. Um, it was here shortly ago. Well, here it is. Okay. So let's see if this can transfer enough heat to turn this into a useful connection. Come along. I think, I think that's togethered. <laughs> so just really making this whole um, wire is going to be grounded. Of course, when you have the whole braided wire cluster grounded, you've got to think quite carefully about where you, and where these wires come to on their way back into the cavity because if you're not careful um, with this braided wire approach it's actually very it's quite easy to quickly get into shorting things out because the you forget that you've got this braided wire so it can't the, the wire has to when it comes in um, sorry when it goes out it comes in and out so you have to kind of shield it when it comes back to the jack so you have to make sure it goes nowhere in any connection with anything else um, so sometimes I'm just thinking sometimes in a way you'd be better if the, if the last wire or the wire that contains the hot to the jack, it's sort of almost better if that one wasn't a braided wire, but then you lose the benefit of the um, shielding all the way through. So 
So if we do run this one back to now from here to the jack, then it makes sense to uh, to shield it off. I, I put it in some shrink tubing and make sure it's safely isolated. Okay, so I just was prepping those bits. <laughs> now, just thinking aloud, um, one of these has to go, you know, one goes to the top for grounding and one goes, to the, so the core, will strip that back and the core will run on, or we can take it all the way across to the jack. Let me just check something. Stay where you are. Stay where you are. That goes to there. That should fit all the way through. Okay. So that should be fine. Um, I think this wants to go back a bit. Let's do that. Okay. Yeah. So I've got it. It's it's enough to run through. Well, obviously the the other ones will stop before they won't go as long as the jack one but I've made all three of them the same length to begin with partly because I haven't decided which one's the jack anyway So we know what's what, we know what's going where, and we're going to have to unpick things. Um, and I thought I brought my thing for, yeah, I did. Right. So for this end of the deal, we've got to unpick these somewhat. And we want the, a bit fiddly. They do push back, but when you're pushing back so much, you you don't want the whole thing to crumple up into a sort of fat snake. So it's probably good to hand unpick quite a bit of it. Um, and then if you need a bit of extra length at the end, then use the pullback feature. But we know we need the whole length of the whole length of the um, switch cleared because we want the we want this um, earth shielding to stop at the same place at the back of the switch. We only want these uh, cloth covered wires to go forward from that point. It's a bit fiddly. And time keeps on ticking, ticking. So this is the sort of preparation stuff for getting your wiring done. Um, I'm going to do this as a standard less pull wiring, nothing fancy. Um, we can do independent volume controls, but there's a, there's a sort of, if there's a thing about that, it's, it's much of a muchness. I used to think, well, why does one, you know, when they're joint them, they're both on, why does one turn the other one off? And of course it's, it's so that if you're playing and you need a volume control it from a playing player's perspective if you're using both pickups together the last thing you really want is two independent volume controls because that would mean that to fade out in a song or whatever you were doing you would have to um, physically control both pots at the same or both knobs at the same time which would be kind of unfeasible from a player point of view although it you know, from a design point of view, sometimes you look at it and you go, "Well, why, why does, why does turning the volume, uh, turning the neck volume down, turn the the um, the bridge pickup off when we're when they're in the middle position, both on?" It's just that's kind of logical. I get why it does now. I didn't used to, so I think I'll do it very straightforward. There, there are occasions where you definitely don't want one to turn down the others. Um, I can't think what those occasions might be now, but you definitely don't. And then in that case, you, you can sort of rig them up in a way that they don't get stuck with each other. Um, so anyway, look at this. I mean, I could stop the tape here. Tape, what are we, analog? 
I could stop the recording, but you know it's almost more trouble to do that than to carry on. So I will just carry on what I'd normally be doing if this was just not... Because often I don't do these refurbs on camera because they're so long. Um, and you'll, <laughs> you'll understand why when you got sick of this. Um, about the other, probably the only person who won't be sick of it will be um, Dave watching it because it's his guitar. But um, yeah, normally I would probably not do these on video and I would this sort of thing would be accompanied by listening to the radio or having a Skype, a Skype, Zoom conversation or something like that. Anyway. But, heck, you can see. Now, technically, I could unpick this all the way back to this cluster here and use that as the junction, or use that as a bit, but I, w I won't because I'd like to keep my colour coordinations on and then um, so I'll tangle these three sets of braids, split up braids, back together again as one. And we'll use that as the, the bit to do to the back of the switch. And I won't attempt to make it a thin bit of wire to push through the eye of the switch. We'll just do it as a clump that glues to the back of the switch with a blob of solder. Perfectly good grand connection. But at the same time, I think I'll tie into it a little jumper wire, which I know will go to the wall of the cavity and ground that out. Ow, just poked my finger. Charlie bit my finger. Did you hear about that? You people of a certain age, I've probably spoken about this before, but it's um, if you haven't heard about it, you better get wise to it right now. It's called, <laughs> there's a new thing out there called a non-fungible token. NFT and it's a new thing you can buy and invest in if you so wish and you go what the hell is a non-fungible token and why would I buy one um, and believe me I, I kind of would be in the same camp as you until I found out what it was but uh, a non-fungible token is a si is where you buy the copyright ownership rights to the original the original example or instance or has yeah I suppose it would be called the original instance of a piece of art which doesn't have a s solid presence or a piece of something or, an, or a social phenomenon so if it was art you can imagine people buying paintings that's I presume that's a fungible token you buy the painting you've got the only one it's proof that Monet painted it therefore you're the wealthy dude who owns it do that, right? Well, the non-fungible token is when you is what I guess what they call a thing that you can buy the original of, or buy what we all agree is the original of, um, and then own the copyright of that original, henceforth onwards. Um, and you might say, well, what in the Billions of blue blazes is the point of doing that, you might say, understandably. Um, and I would be, I would understand you wanting to say that. Oh yeah, look how dirty these wires are. Look, you can never do a clean wiring job. Anyway, yeah. So uh, yeah, you might say, why, why would I want to buy the no a non-fungible token? Um, because it's something to own and sell to someone else who wants it. So. Like any market, like anything in the market, it's only worth anything because the market says it is. Um, and so it obviously takes a bunch of people to agree together to start deciding that the original of something in its digital form has a value. So the um, people have together agreed that the original recording of Charlie bit my finger, which was a um, that cute little meme that in the earliest of early days of social media went viral, and uh, you know, and made it. Well, at the time, probably made it. It made the dad who took the pictures of it, took the video of his sons messing around. Probably made him some advertising money. But eventually, it comes to a point where. 
that gets sold. And um, he's, he's now, oops, that's nothing in there. He's now sold the original. I think it was, what was it? Oh God, I've forgotten now. 100, uh, 600,000 pounds, something like that. Anyway, about half a million quid. He sold it so that he's half a million quid richer. The family goes out and buys a nice house or whatever. And um, somebody else now can decide who can or can't see that video. We could say, well, what the point, what's the point of owning it? Does it mean that you can stop everyone else playing it? Well, I, I don't know about that exactly, but my first guess would be probably, since you own the original. Um, but, or, or what's agreed to be the original. Um, so that's it, yeah, it's buying things that don't have digital digital assets or no, are they assets yeah they're assets because because if everyone else is as nutty they'll go up in value because everybody will <laughs> like to hold on to the original ownership um one two three four i need another one of these so these are going to be my contact points for the for screwing into the um, screwing into the, what am I screwing? Screwing into the conductive cavities with a little metal screw, and then these will touch those, and or solder them together, and then that will be a, a nice electrical connection. So in a sense, it could it could be that these go on here like this and get crimped in place. Um, only it won't do it very well. So. What I'll do is I will stick, I'll flatten these with another pliers, different set of pliers, um, but these will become just little lifted solder lugs or lugs to solder things too. Um, one of them will have a bit of wire on it, and I'll do it here and now so that I'll be able to connect this one, one particular one, to the um, the wall of the switch cavity, the three-way switch cavity, cubity. So what I'll do is I'll put that through there, squish it with the thing, and then we'll solder it. This end will go on to there when the time is right. So I'll just basically clean that back, throw that on the floor. And what I'll do is I'll just load this up with a, a blob of solder to give me a sort of extra bit of help when it comes to it. Ladle it on, my friend. Ladle it on. Nice big blob. There we go. So that's that. These, um, this bit here is going to be the soldering bit. So I could load that as well just to help me along the way. So bend it. Because I want to screw them in, but I want these little lugs to stand away so that you can get some heat into them to connect things up. So for that end, I'll just sort of dangle them there and load them up. And then I'd usually drill a little pilot hole in the in the wood, ready for the screw. So it's all easy enough when the time comes and it won't, won't provide a, a load of hassle. So this is just preloading the, the tab, hopefully, so that it will give me a, a, a good, good grip when the time is right. One, two, three. All right. Go there. Stay there. Okay. So if I were to now come back, back to the place 
Uh, now, what was I going to do? Back, forwards, front, back, right. Okay, let's run this through again. Run him through. So, through you go. Now, we've got some lumpy plastic bits now, which might be just getting in the way, making things just a little bit more difficult. <laughs> Come on. Oh, you hopeless. Come on. So <laughs> difficult. It's now sticking out and stopping it going through. Thank you. You. Nice and easy, please. made it harder on myself by adding these bits of plastic, but I wanted to keep careful track of what was what. Okay, so through we come, and as we come through to there, there are my little bits sticking out, and so what I'll do is I'll get me some small screws. Uh, I will then get me a drill bit, a small drill bit. I will get me some of these lugs. Screwdriver tip, head thing. Here we go. It will suddenly tidy up in a minute, miraculously, when I get sorted. So here are, here's the screwdriver for sinking my pilot screw hole. So the first one something like this. There we go. You can't see it very well at all, but I've got me a little... Why have I got this attached to there? Help. Everything is stuck to everything right now. It's driving me mad. Right, so I, that's um, that little tab sticking up. Now I'm going to sew it in a minute. I'll solder that onto there and press it down. In fact, I might be better off pressing it down slightly anyway because um, although we want a gap, I think we want this to sit as low as possible under the pickup. Right, so that's that one there. And then this one will go here. So I'll hand wash in a minute. And then I think I'm going to need to switch off and do a tidy up so I can get myself ready for 
of soldering part and fitting all the pots and whatnots. There we go, that one's in there. Again, easy to connect up to. And if I wanted to be particular, I could put this over here. Oops, no, I don't want to do that, do I? Come back. I'm going to keep those where they were. So what we can do is put that down there, like that. And we could then put our... our little side one in there. Which is this one. ready to hook up when the switch is in um, and then yonder switch could in fact now go in let's just check so down that's the bridge one that's always the way it points down is bridge connection that's it. so down is bridge the other one is the other one. So I'm just going to put those together, line it up. Uh, no, wait a minute. We haven't got the... We'll hold off that. We haven't got the thing yet. Hold that one. We'll go back in time and clean up that rhythm treble thing. So one more thing. I'm going to want to ground things to the wall of this cavity. So uh, I'm going to go in here with... If I can keep it to stay in place. lug for grounding this cavity. Okay, so those are those bits. I suppose what I could do now is try and scrape off. I think what we'll probably be better off doing is sticking it's down, it's very thin. We could stick it down with another piece of the same stuff, but we have to try and get this crappy stuff off it first, which is not easy with the bare fingernails. Lucky I've got some, some nails. Um, try it over here. Out of the way. Yeah, I'll use some of that double-sided duck tape that I use for templates and that will do. Scrapey scrape, scrape, scrape. And what I'll do is a little bit of cleaning on the other side just to get rid of any goo. Um, there we are. So some what's that stuff? Naphtha on one side. If it takes the lettering off then so be it. No, it's the same. Okay. It's as clean as it's uh, gonna be. So next bit we get the remains of the duct tape from here. A sharp knife. Or a sharpest messer, as we used to say out in the Germany. We'll cut a square of this stuff. Stick it on the back of that stuff. And then the fun part is trying to cut round it because 
it wants to cut the plastic of the disc as much as anything else. Yeah, the problem problem with this is you get you get this horrible sort of little bit of overhang. You can never get it exactly flush using this stuff. But on the other hand, it's a bit cleaner than some other substances that would make a permanent bond on the uh, finish of the guitar. So I think this will work. If I just cut off any last visible bits of white, this we covered up in the middle, so I don't need to worry about that. There's that, there's that. Close enough. All right, let's just flip this over. put this through there like that hold it on in a straight line sorry if you can't see this now I'm going to just put that on get this straightened up tighten it up and sometimes it's, it's quite good to get it in position and then if you've got a block of something you can put in there to hold it it's quite handy to be able to do that and then you need the special t turning thing. <laughs> so here's my keeping it straight. Keep it straight. Do it up. Jolly good. Okay. <laughs> um, right. So now we have the wiring all the way through there. Now, next thing I've got to do is I'm going to come back over here, and I think we should just bring bring the guitar body here, move as many things out of the way as quickly as possible. You out the way. You out the way. You out the way. Make sure a bit of room. Thank you. And then what, what to do is just get these little lugs. See you in a minute. These little ground lugs done up, um, and then we can sort of stop worrying about them. Again, I can't really see what's going on here. Something like that. Okay. So what we know is. We've got to get the bits we want where we want them. So I didn't leave much room there, which is a bit silly, but I, I didn't want to, I wanted to do this. Um, right, I wanted to do it in the guitar rather than out, but could undo it, could attach the thing, but we should be able to do it from here. No, you know what, I'll, I'll undo it one more time. Silly me. Perhaps being a bit more circumspect. Okay. Undo, 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 undo. Out. Right. Over here comes. Friendly little helping arms. What we'll do is we will grab this if we can. And um, we just need to lay some 
Let's hold on to here. What's now? Why is this moving around? Why is this? Come on, this doesn't move at all. Mm. Right. The difficulty with this soldering iron is that it doesn't like to do large areas like that because it just doesn't. Okay, so let's go. What are we going to do? Should we do purple? Should we do purple? Let's get closer, as close as we can. Should we do purple in the bottom one? Where's my cutter? Let's go get the... Oh, it's here. So. We'll call it purple. See, the thing I don't like about this is when you do it using this pushback stuff, it's all the furry gets gets caught up in it. And what I don't like is... See all that fluff? It sort of gets in the way. then you actually, to cut it off, you have to run the risk of, see, you never get it. Can you burn it? I think I can burn it off because it's annoying me. Let's try it, shall we? Pow. Yeah, sort of. Something like that. Right, purple. Bridge. Purple is bridge. Go to there. Stop there. Can we go to purple? When it does that, pulls it all the way through. got next on the list. I think we'll go yellow for hot outs, right? Let's see if I can just avoid. Let's just use the stretch. So we said what? We said hot, hot outs. So we're going to go blue is neck. Got that everyone? Blue is neck. <laughs> Blue is neck. Marvellous. Blue is neck and whatever this one is. Yellow is the output. Come on, you lot. I hate the fact this is braided. Why couldn't it be a stiff single core? Well, let's make it one. Let's burn this off first. <sighs> Thank you. Let's load this up and make it a single core. Johnny Go. Oh no, do you know what I've done? It's too short. <sighs> mm. 
trying to get it up to here without it running the risk of touching the darned core structure, the grounded core structure of the switch, which is threatening to do. Come on, through you go. Okay, well that's through there, that will do. Stop poking backwards. When you, um, I don't know what you can see anymore, but when you put this back in, you do have to be careful uh, not to um, you have to be careful not to uh, touch any of those um, lugs against the inside of the shield. That's where it could go wrong. Now I want to join this to here, if I can. It's just, there's not enough heat in this damn thing. <sighs> Hold on. Let's get the thermonuclear auction out. It'll take a little while to heat up. to do is to get this attached to there. And then I need to get that one attached to there. Hmm, slow. So, I mean, the, the point I could attach this to could be anywhere. In fact, let's just get on and attach this one to here earlier on in the thing. Get that one out of the way. Come along now. These friendly helping hands are so good. Ouch. Okay, that one's attached to there. And really all we've now got to do is get this that one to there. And this eventually heats up to its thermonuclear levels.
this thing is pure knackered. With this is that you don't know. If you've got enough hands to hold it, you don't know if it's properly stuck. I don't think it is. I just need to somehow need to hold it down. Problem is it's going to want to bounce back up unless I can hold it in place. Which I can't do without an extra pair of hands. Hey look something like this. You get out of the way because you're nothing. You ain't no help at all. there and join I think that's joined up <laughs> off off and off okay so now we go into there Pull this through out of the way. What you can't tell with this thing is whether or not these darn things are touching out on the <sighs> touching out on the wall so I'm going to bend them off to one side a bit in the hope and I'm going to put a little bit of uh, tape in here as possible insulation that, that's that, that's that, that's that. So, for some reason now, this is refusing to play ball. <laughs> I 
actually can't see what it's doing. This is doing my head in now. <coughs> I think what I'm going to have to do is cut these bits of plastic off now because they are definitely getting in the way. End of this session for you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <sighs> Such a pain. Sorry, the view's gone out window for a minute. Um, it's hard to get this thing done up. So, big problem, biggest problem with this whole thing is you've literally got so little room to work productively in that I've frankly don't quite know how you get it to stay <laughs> in place and done up right so now I'm just looking at this okay that's clear of the wall that's now pressed up against there which is no bloody good at all see little things like that just unbelievably dopey you are clear of that moving no that's good that's good that's not touching anything that's clear of that that's grounded to that that's good <laughs> right that should be all done and then we're back through here now while I'm at it let's just get this last little things done possibly some of the most annoyingly difficult things let's get oh, maybe I should have kept this thing on let's get these tacked down into those and we'll be ready to go. Not be grounded out and we'll know. Just, I've just gone and done the impossible thing. We said yellow's in the middle, purple's at the bottom, didn't we? Didn't we? Purple's at the bottom. See, I couldn't have got it shut up with those damn things on. Right, well, 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 we know the yellow's, yellow's the output anyway. That's the good thing. Would you just work? Unbelievable. These things just don't work. Done there. This one here.
right, that one there. One more to do on the back side. In the hole. Okay, that doesn't reach to there. So, this one, I will attach another little wire. Right, sorry, this uh, I've kind of run out of brain power just getting this done. <laughs> um, so what I'm doing is I'm going to hook this ground up to a sort of common lug. It's going to sit in the wall. And I've got wires, everything in the way of everything here. So I need a good clean up and a cup of tea. And I'm just going to spray some more waterborne poly before it's too late to do any. Right. So I'll go from there to there. I want this one here is a earth wire, it's the bridge earth, so we don't need all of this extensive wire, but we will. Let's have some more. Everything gets in the way of everything else. Get that loaded up. So that's going to go to that thing there, which is going to ground us nicely to the wall. We can soften that up enough, like so. So that's the bridge ground sorted out the way. This now will ground, ouch, ground the earth, will, this will ground the cage, like that, a little jumper, and then technically we know what we've got, so we know that yellow is the output to here, we want the yellow to reach all the way out here, which it does. Mm, that's good. And we decided that purple was the bottom one. <laughs> How do we do that? Purple was bridge. Well, let's make purple bridge, and that's going to come down to want it to stay out of the way so it needs only about that much. And the same with the blue, but we'll leave that separate for a minute. So the purple is going to have it's going to be the output to the switch from the bridge volume. So that's going to run from here. Split away or stripped out wire first, and then we're going to have that horrible cloth covered business as well. See if we can just do a push back with that this time. So there's our our 
I had this, I mean, quite often people just, um, they just kind of stick out to the top of the pot. In fact, it doesn't even need that much, does it? Come across there to there. Well, we'll run with that much. So let's do it the tidy way. Let's get rid of this little cluster of stuff and we'll go and add some solder right onto this pot here, onto this wire here we can get it to soak up some heat we can then load that and it should be able to solder directly to the pot top at the right time that's nifty in fact we could be mucho cheeky and do that push back so this is the output to the switch remember so it comes out of there like that why not We could we could put a little bit of um, solder on there first to give it a hand right in the middle. Now this thing's getting bloody hot now. Okay, so there's my will that go onto there? Come on, stay on. I think so. So there's our our ground out to out to there. We want to. We can pop that in there. Put it through. Ah, I'm still hot. need to get the thingy mm, just a more spanner for this but yeah I like that that's a tidy little number just a more spanners right m after I've put the two volumes in I promise I'm going to go and um, I'm going to go and do that bit of spraying turn the cameras off I'll probably run out of batteries anyway so it wouldn't be such a bad idea Okay, so that's interesting. So oh, this thing already, if you don't get it right, it risks touching out. That's a, that's a funny little thing. So we know we're saying that's the bridge one. Hmm. Let's go a bit shorter on this one. I'm trying to avoid having any um, crossover. Like I say, that that whole business with the the braid being a grounding wire, an earth wire, is tricky. And you've got to keep it away from everything else that's got an important live lug on it. So in this case, um, I can see. I guess what we probably ought to have done is put some shrink wrap on it. Maybe I'll do that. I can't do it now, but maybe we'll do it with this one see how it looks the next time so there's my uh -huh. twist that off chop it off get a bit of the old shrink tubing that so much problem is if you do shrink wrap this you can't really get into there with the heat gun to do much with it Technically, you could keep it away somewhat from the. Uh, well, it probably helps just to keep it safe from the other bits that you don't want it to touch out on. Ouch, this thing's hot. Right. 
bit of that. It's a bit of somewhere in the middle of that to get it in the mood. Thank you. Okay. Pull back, push back, I should say. Get out of the way. Down there like that. This is crap. I hate the way that the coating the cloth tries to go through the hole with the wire. I don't want that in there, damn it. I just want the thing to stick. I thought my life would be improved with these, these here extra helping hands, but do you know what? It really hasn't. Not a thing has improved at all. So I'm just struggling away. So there's me, me fist, two, me volume pots gone in there. I just now put this one in here. Again, we've got we've got um, the, the uh, ground wire of the that's taking the signal to the jack, kind of in the way. So you have to watch out that, that doesn't hit anything untoward in the, along its journey. <laughs> Turn this up. So that's one that absolutely does need some tubing, this one here, because if I don't, it's going to catch on something. Snip this yellow identifier off. Okay, so that's a safety thing. I can run that all the way through there, keep it clear of everything else. There's those two in place. And that can just tweak out the way for a minute. Okay, so that's safe. That's clear of there. Let's push that out the way a bit further. Tighten it up. Okay. Nice. Two pots done. Um, now the remainder are pretty straightforward. I mean, it's two volume pots. Here they come. We'll get some capacitors from my Chinese Chinese but perfectly good capacitor, capacitor department. We'll attach those. Let's see if we can do those in situ. anything work like this. That would be too easy. So what we have to do is we have to part solder it first. Use this as a grip. I 
like that. Stick that on there like that. Use the mega hot thing like that. It's nice having that, um, that extra heat when you need it, I have to say. So we cut that off there, cut that off there. Do an extra join there just to make sure. Because it wasn't very solid to fix the first time. Okay, that's the first one. Next one, follow the same path. Should be straightforward. Oh yeah, then we've got to run the pickups in. Ho, ho, ho. So, <sighs> bridge, treble, tone, I mean treble, bridge tone, bridge tone. and neck tone. Come on, get on. Take a, take a bite, come along. Good, that's good. That's not so good, that's better. <laughs> okay, okay. Put, tighten these up and then it'll be time to stop. All right, all good stuff. Ready to go, time to stop. Let's see what we're doing with the camera. We're still going. Woohoo! Two hours. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to stop because I do need to get the um, some spraying done in a minute, but I'll come back. Well, yeah, well, let's get on with it. Here we are, ladies and gents. We're back in the game with... It's time to fit the new pickups. And um, I don't know if you'll pick this up on the camera at some point, but sporting a neat, let's see what you can see on there. Oh yeah, hold on, there we are. A neat little thwack yesterday, courtesy of, um, I very cleverly used my, um, what I call the, uh, the Irvin, Irwin, 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 the Irwin clamp spray, guitar spray holder tool. Um, and that means I clamp uh, an Irwin clamp sideways to a door and then use that as a uh, 
the back of the, the clamp as a a thingy, a thing to hang the thingy, a thing to hang the, you know what I'm saying, off. A thing to hang the uh, guitar off to dry. And anyway, the point about that is that um, in doing so, it was great, worked really nicely as intended, and then I forgot it was there, and I stood up and walked straight into it and smacked me head on it, as you can see. So that was the payoff for such silliness. Oh, yeah. Right, so I've got some, some old screws here from the original, which I'll reuse, um, because I don't have any of these silver long ones anyway, so I'll use these They're in fairly good nick. So we should be able to get these in. Let's just double check. This is all in the right place. Uh. Oh, well, yeah, we need it to be in the right place. Can't see a thing. This won't help really, will it? Nope, not at all. Okay. Um, yeah, so I got a, a piece of tail end of a Irwin clamp in the brain and thankfully it uh, it was a, a mere flesh wound as they say in the movies um, but it hurt as you can imagine but no long-term harm was done thankfully so. Oh, and I, I, we have a sort of thing where I come back in and I say to Claire, yep, all my, got all my fingers, and therefore it's been a successful day in the workshop. And so I came in last night and said, I've got all my fingers, but, at which point she knows I've done something else. And in this case, it was a smack on the head. But like I say, a purely a superficial wound, although it's given me a headache um, it was a bit hard, um, but it's not a cut that's very deep. It was just a sort of skid, because mainly there isn't much behind there in the brain department. Well, if you see what I mean, there's a, yeah, not a lot of meat. It's just skull. That's all there is to it. Anyway, so that was that. that like, when I did that yesterday, I thought, well... I think it's about time to end the session and go home. I was pretty sure I'd had enough by that point. Anyway, so today has um, been a slow day. Um, and what we've mainly got, uh, what, what I've done today is uh, hand back Paul's Harley Benton to him. And, you know, after all of my worries about it, he, he could barely even notice the um, the nut damage. Um, but, you know, I, I get uptight about it because it's, it's a big deal to me. And it's, it's sort of it shows a, a something about the, the manufacturing process, which I which annoys me hugely. OK, so. Um, Right, let's just double check this. Our ground comes into there, comes back to there, grounds off there onto there. That's the top. That's groundy ground, ground, ground. Everything's grounded. That's grounded to there. That goes to the same place. Therefore, that's grounded. Um, what we will need to do still is hook up the pots together. So we've got these two. Um, we've got neck pickup here, and we've got bridge pickup here. There's a lot of wire here, more than you really need. And to be honest, um, I don't care too much for carrying more wire, a lot more wire than we need. Um, some people might like the idea of it because, you know, if they reuse the pickup somewhere else, they might want a bit extra wiring left over. But co to be quite honest, this is going to go get played in this guitar from now until it's curtains for this old creature, I think. Um, so really what we want here is a good working electrics cavity, not 
stacking up tons of extra cable for, for some future um, contingency. The thing is, with a two core cable like this, it's, it's very straightforward. So if you really did want or need to extend it, um, then, you know, frankly, you could just add some to it instead of carrying around extra cable when you don't need it. If you see what I'm uh, saying. So I'm just basically in this session now is this sort of hopefully the completion. We've got the neck done, the frets all precision leveled out, ready for the action that I set. If you remember, I set up when the uh, when there was no hardware other than the bridge and the stop bar on. We just used it to get the right geometry and the right setup which we've done so that's the sort of in a way that's the, a lot of the precision part so now this is the functional part of getting the electrics up and running i'm conscious that whoops i'm conscious i've got a very hot draper soldering iron broiling away to my right here and the reason oh well that would help wouldn't it <sighs> so i will put this to work right now it's already there. Um, yeah, so this is the functional bit. Um, I'll get this sorted. Oh, I think I'll do while I'm at it. Let's load this a little bit more because we're going to put this onto the top of the pot. So we might start with a nice big blob of solder ready to do the biz. And actually what we can do is cut that short after there because we don't need it. And also we don't need all of this either. And we don't want bits of stuff in there. So after, when it's time, when I finish this little guitar, the next thing is I'm just going to stay here on the soldering department. Now oh, this has got stuck. Come on solder stay here in the soldering department and um, I'm going to do the, l the last and final only ever uh, attempt at getting this preamp working that I bought. Um, I've got it vaguely working but it's always been on the outside of the guitar and quite honestly unless you have it all hooked up in the guitar you can't really know if it's working or not so it's been a bit of a dead loss so far so I'm hoping to find a way of testing it tonight uh, but to do that I'm going to have to go with whole hog and set it up so it comes out of the guitar and I can have the guitar playing with strings on at the same time so that's going to be a challenge okay so just for a second let's get some green tape uh -huh, okay we'll just keep these things out of the way for a minute um, blue over there red over here and what I'll do is I'm just going to prep the tops of these pots we want some um, we want some ground wire to run all the way around the top now it is entirely possible to do this in the form of uh, either braided wire or a piece of bare wire so you can do it that way um, the only downside is you have to be, well, there's only one downside. If you do it that way, you've got to be sure that your, actually I might do it that way. You've got to be sure that your wire doesn't touch anything or run the risk of grounding anything else out that shouldn't be grounded, if you get what I mean. Now let's, let's use this. Since I don't really like this cloth covered wire anyway, let's, let's nick the, uh, Nick the bare wire from the middle and throw the rest away. Right, oops, sorry. Now, to, to do this, we're going to hook all these up together. So we're going to need a few blobs of solder ready made with this awful plasticky um, thing. So we're going to come in there and out there. So what we really want is, I can get the that to coil in under there, it would help. Mm. 
a bit difficult to get the solder in here. I'm just trying to make a blob to the right, sorry, to the left hand side, if you're looking at it from here, of these uh, of the pots, because that's where the um, pickup wiring is going to come in. And I'm going to want to ground those right there as well. But then on the other side, I will want the earth ground sort of spot. So I'm going to do that right towards the edge of the pot out here, if I can actually get anything heated up enough. Okay. So I just had, um, when, when Paul came over to pick up his Harley Benton, we had a little moment. He's a bit of a hedgehog fan, so we got to sort of marvel together at um, our hedgehog visitor who would come round perfectly to time. It was that time of the day, so he'd appeared from wherever he, she lives and um, basically announcing its presence, saying, come on now, feed me, please. problem with this is I can't get it in that close from this angle. Thank you. Okay, so to begin with, we will drop that on there. If I can just hold the damn thing, then we could get it stuck down, right? Thank you. Failure of um, dexterity there. Right, you out the way. And you across there to there. So this has got to avoid any uh, lugs that we don't want it to touch. It doesn't matter if it touches the the um, cavity wall. See now, I can't get enough heat onto that. This is a, uh, this cable, this sort of PVC cable on here is just terrible. It makes it impossible to do anything. I can't get, uh, I can't get any heat onto it. Come along you. Thank you. Right, round we come. Ouch. Now this doesn't, frankly, give me a very good angle either. Yeah, so today it's finishing this, followed by um testing or trying to get the preamp set up on my Encore Strat, the red one. A bit of luck. And if we can get that working, then I will basically um, the plan will be to leave it leave that one in there and put the other one, the next one into JT's made in Korea strat, the white one that I've got here to do exactly that with. So the plan will be if we can if we can get that particular preamp working reliably and understand how to wire it so it does work reliably, then the aim will be to get it fitted to a lot of quite a few of JT's guitars where he wants the um, a bit of a boost when he switches to a single coil or the coil split I should say function. Okay, don't lump the lump, lump all of those ground dead. Lovely. Okay, so that's a nice spare bit of wire. So now we have the red and white. Now, before we do that, we've got to take a leap across. In both cases, now we need the tone jumper to go from the 
uh, to sh the shared lug where the uh, pickup hot comes in and to go across to the tone pot in each case. And so that shares a lug with the hot from the pickup. So before we put the hot from the pickup in, we go neck, here is the neck, let's run that through, push that one in from the back, come on. Very difficult to get it to stay anywhere. Let's tie it off there a minute. So what we could do is, again, using the nuclear option, is to get the ground. Not very good dexterity at the moment. It's, a, it's tricky. You don't want to solder that one in f to place just yet because you want to get the other one in. So you want to put it through so at least you know where this one has to sit down. So I'm going to have to just take the, take the, go with a guess on that. Pretty good guess, but and then we put that onto there like that. Nicely grounded. Hurrah. Then we add in the, uh, the jumper. But what we can do at this point is we can pull that one now a little bit further through. This has to share the same socket, but I, I probably would be better off at this point tinning the ends of these because otherwise they run the risk of stripping out or splitting apart when it comes to pushing them in to share the lug. I know what I mean. Uh, yeah, I might as well do both ends. Gosh darn it. Okay. Let's do this one first. So this goes in doubles up with that one and now the only thing we have to do is get it to rest somewhere comfortably so that we can solder them in together. Obviously the view of this would be rubbish because I can't get this thing Right, that's that. So that's that's the neck um, thingy done. <laughs> that is the neck hot to the lug to the volume pot lug input lug, and jumped across now to the tone. And again, it's a pretty simple circuit. So this goes in the the first lug on the tone side or first looking at it from this angle there we have it so that's the neck in to the neck volume pot um, across to the tone input very good tone take that under there tone um, capacitor grounded everything's good everything's good Okay, so on this side now we can push that bit of ground, or bridge ground out of the way because we've got that sorted. And then this one, oh, I forgot one thing. There is, I knew there was something I'd forgotten. Oh, um, darn, I think I just put something. No, I won't do it. Okay, I forgot to um, ground the volume pots. I knew there was an empty lug staring me in the face on each, in each case. Right, well let's just take care of the bridge hot. Here comes the bridge hot. Here comes the bridge tone jumper to share the pot with the hot. Much sh smaller, shorter thing here, but it doesn't matter. I'm not going to start 
messing about with it now since it's already a bit short who cares so that's nicely nestled in or as we say in the modern age nestled and I've said this before years ago but when I was a child I had a fleeting glimpse caught a fleeting glimpse no when I was a child Nestles was called Nestles, not Nestle. You understand? It probably still had the accent over the final E, but we didn't pay it no heed because we was we was British, you see, English. We didn't have to pander to foreign pronunciations. Good heavens, no. there was any comprehension issues when it came to language then we just shouted louder if you remember that was the British way right so now I'm going to just um, ground this here down but I want to push this blue one as far out of the way as possible because I need to get the heat it is on. Okay, so now I think we might be. I think we are a. Oh no, we've got a little bit more thermonuclear heat that we require. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to borrow a couple of little bits of wire from the this here capacitor, which will live to capacitate another day. Meanwhile, this, and what I'll do is I'll put a tiny bit of solder on the front of each of these lugs so that I can use it to hold the wire down. I need to move these a little bit out of the way to gain access. Then we begin with you go on there like that, and you go in there like that. So the purpose, of course, of this is to um, ground that lug of the pot. And that's the end of all the solder on this roll, real roll. We have run out. Good, good, good. Good. And then I'll turn this big, mm, yeah, I'll turn that one off. We'll use controlled heat from now onwards. So I'll just double heat the bottom end so it's a proper solid connection. Lovely. And then we'll snip off the excesses. Okay, now according to this, or normal systems, we have basically just the um, jack to put on now, and I can't remember where that's gone, so I may have to search for it. Um, but let's just double check. So bridge into there, bridge into lug one, out to switch, switch back out to jack here. Good, good. Um, we are now looking for 
a decent quality jack socket and the plate which uh -huh. I may or may not have left up here. Yeah, it's here. Um, what do we need to undo this? It's over there. Um, hmm. Let's see what we've got. Just done a quick look out for the remaining screws. One, two, three, four. These don't look massively suitable. Um, there's another one there, but it's already used. Okay, sorry, muttery, muttery. Um, these are probably the better options. Let's see if I've got some miscellaneous screws in here. Miscellaneous screws. Miscellaneous screws. There's the four I could use. Hmm. So without tipping this whole thing upside down, which is always the way, I can't really tell what's what. But for this, what I ideally want is flat top screws that will bite and hold. I'm about to be them in here. I'm just trying to avoid if I can, the um, countersunk ones, because they stick up a bit and don't look quite so good. So I'm hunting around for some flat top ones of pretty much any length, really. Well, not too extreme. That's countersunk. Get there. Countersunk, countersunk, countersunk. Mm, countersunk. Spares there. Um, what I don't really want is the ones I don't want to use um, tuna screws. They're a bit on the small side. Although these, I've got some. Um, what do they call them? They would be pickup ring screws. I've got some here in um, chrome, which have a very, very shallow counter sink. So actually they're not bad as well, because they're long and they'll hold the jack plate on nicely. So I've got a, a, I'll get a handful of those lined up in case that's the better option. Can get just four of those, I would be happy. There, and there's the fourth one. All right, there's a there's a few options. Scrape all of this back in. And this is, I mean, it's the funny part. This is an absolutely minuscule fraction of all the spares I've chucked away over the years. You just you get so many bits and pieces. You only need to keep a certain amount, really. The danger is, or the mistake is, when you keep everything <laughs> because you just run out of room so it's like as long as you've got a, a workable amount okay so this this is quite um quite snug fitting i've only got one go at this really because it's it's tight fitting so i'm going to need to prize off sorry you won't be able to see very well i want to unpick braid on this as carefully as possible and then we'll twist it and use that to attach to the ground lug of jack socket and then we don't need too much length but we should be all right okay thank you thank you come on Right, let's uh, take this apart. So it's a very cheap original uh, plate, but it will do. And we'll 
throw away the broken original old thing and we'll use a new Nutric quality jack. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Now for this I tend to end up using a different set of pliers if I can find them. Got to get this tightened up. Um, Now, sometimes I've been known to put on a tiny bit of lock tight thread lock. That's what I'm looking for. Thread lock holiday. Um, it's not great. Sometimes you can you can overdo it, and I have in the past. So, in my willing or eagerness to make sure the damn thing doesn't move ever, um, you make the mistake of making it unreleasable ever. And that becomes that can be an absolute pain on certain guitars. You you struggle to get the thing off again, and somebody, not many people, will thank you for that down the line. Um, okay, so there's my there's my ground. That's just uh, probably could have used the thermonuclear heat on this point here, but let's just try and. Get it done with this. It's failing to transfer the heat adequately. ground grounded and then we'll just very carefully do a bit of a pull back here if I can hang on to it <laughs> See, I don't like this braided thing here because it's just making this part difficult Well, sort of. Okay, okay. So this has to fit comfortably in. Now the problem with this always is these vintage holes that the guitars are designed to go in are quite small. So it, it sort of necessitates squeezing this the positive the hot in a little bit to if we can help it get it out of harm's way um, because we don't want it grounding out even on the inside of the little tunnel um, that can just cause it to, to short or to the signal to cut out So these are good long screws going in to what would otherwise be tired holes. But they're a good fit. Right, now the thing to do now is to do a test. Because if this doesn't work, um, then we've got a problem.
all is good. All is good in New Year's Day. Right, that's the hot Bernie business out of the way. Now, I do think in the meantime we've got a few little fills um, to do and some pilot hole drilling to put the tuners and stuff back in. But I think what I need to do is tidy up the workbench now, take a break, um, tidy the workbench, come back um, when that's ready to complete this. See you in a min. Okay, well, done a few things since we last spoke. Um, actually, what I've mainly done is sort out the, um, basically fill in all the holes that need need filling in. So the uh, screw holes reinforced them and stuff. So everything's got new <coughs> new screw holes. Okay, so here's the nice part of it. We come to do everything up and put some strings on. Oh, I don't even know what you can see here. I'm not just even thinking about that. I'm so sorry. Okay. Thank you. Glue. <laughs> These old styly knobs, speed knobs. Perfectly good though. Zero, zero. Ooh, that one's a bit on the loose side. Let's see if we can just widen that a little bit. There you go. Thank you. So, and again, that one too. That's funny. careful prizing of the pots. They, they're good for that, but you have to be careful not to overstress the metal or else it will just break. Okay, there's our knobs on. Okay, okay. On go the thingies. Um, I took the neck off just now because I was putting on new strap buttons or sorry re redoing the strap buttons so what i did with the strap buttons is i um drilled out six millimeter hole and fitted a big piece of dowel in each end because it was basically too too loose before it'd been worn out so i upped the game and put some new new wood in and then screwed in new well made new pilot holes so I'm going to put nines on this because having um, having read an article or seen a video yesterday actually about a, a guy who had his entire opinions about uh, gauge string gauges changed in one experiment that he did with Rick Beato. Beato sounds silly saying it with an English accent, doesn't it? Rick Beato. Um, Rick Beato uh, did a test tone test with different gauge strings and they all sort of came down to the conclusion that the nines were better all round. And, and more to the point, I think, what was interesting was to hear that the, the guy had recognised that a lot of his preconceptions about it were sort of myths that he'd been, kind of, he'd inherited along the, the journey as a, a player through, you know, forums and the various places you get your kind of indoctrination from. So I thought it was very interesting to hear how that had changed for him. So I'm just going to put that there and get the mirror. Oh, sorry, the mirror. The mirror. And then we can have a look at this bit. So now is the time to fit on the strings. Now, with the, um, with the adjustable nut, Dave, what I would suggest, it does come out, as you know. We've seen it out already. It comes out goes wherever it wants to go. It stays in as well. I mean, it's pretty well fitted. But um, as a rule, I recommend that you fit the G and the D strings first. And then when you're taking strings off, you leave the D and the G strings until last. And that way, you'll have the strings holding down the uh, 
that thing holding down the nut just in case it wants to take off. Now I've um, glued in these uh, ferrules because they were some of them were just not staying in. Oh my god, some of these are a bit on the stiff side. That's better. Yeah, that, so some of them were um, just falling straight out. So rather than have them fall out, I've done a bit of a glue thing on them. Um, that's okay. There we go. So we'll do the G and the D. So I pull the string all the way through taut and then pull it back one uh, fret's worth and then wind it on. And that one fret's worth tends to be enough. So then as I come round, I hold the taut string over the loose string, wind it on, and then push the taut string underneath the loose string on the second time. So first time over, second time under. And that makes a, a sort of... Sometimes you've got enough to go around three times, but makes a pretty good little locking mechanism there, like that. Um, and then we go to the D, and do the same. And then pull back one fret's worth. Um, what am I doing? Come out of there. Come back one for its worth. And just wind it on. Hold it taut over the loose string. As it comes round, push it under the loose string and pull the loose string up to help get it out of the way. And that's your little locking thing done. There we are. Those two. And then you can do whatever ones you want after that. Um, I find that works pretty well as a sort of locking system, um, but also fits the, the least amount of um, string or a reasonably small amount of string onto the tuner post. So it doesn't have to be none, but you do want to, I mean, it's a good idea to minimize it if you can. So. Hold push down, feed under, pull up. Get it onto the saddle roller. Okay, so we've, if you remember, I've already done this once in doing the setup part, so this is really testing it out, putting it back into you know the exact same action that we want. So a little bit of tweaking because what's almost certainly will have happened is that the bridge post, the bridge will be on a different height now because we've taken the posts and the bridge and everything right off. Um, let's cut these short while we're about it. So these are Daddario's. I've, I've changed, I've suddenly changed from early balls. Um, uh, sorry Ernie Ball, partly this is because, hmm, it's partly because, well, people are now faking Ernie Balls, so it would be a really good thing for Ernie Ball to pay some attention to that, um, the way that I know Did Ario has, although I'm not entirely sure I know what their system is, but I think there's a, there's a kind of code here that you can used to check and confirm your strings are genuine but everything about them looks and feels genuine anyway um, but I mean I, I will say it on you know as far as only ball is concerned it's not their fault that some Chinese factories manufacturing fake only ball strings but um, and, and I didn't you know to be fair I wasn't caught out and swindled into buying them I bought some to you know expressly look at the difference between them between the real ones and the fake ones, so I, I got my sort of value out of it, if you like, for being able to do that. But um, so you know, it's not like there's a, a crisis that Ernie Ball needs to address because you know it's the Chinese factories that are doing this, and the eBay and Amazon sellers that are causing the problem by 
merrily selling these things when it's absolutely obvious they're fake. Um, but it's a bit of a total sort of wild frontier on the even in the biggest online retailer environments, far less the you know the real wild frontier of AliExpress and all the other types of places you can get lost in. Okay, so there are the strings on. And um, let's stand you up there for a minute. Zoom out. Okay. So a bit of a gentle pull. Feels like a long time I've been working on this actually. Because when you do a guitar like this, that's you know, and it's a bit of an ancient beastie that's almost everything is getting replaced. Um, yeah, I feel like you've been doing it forever. Going to now check the action and make adjustments. Bear with me. I sort of like to let this settle for a while before playing it. Um, okay, we've got just under 1.5 on the low E and uh, well, a bit high on the high E, so I'll take that down a bit. Very low. Okay, let's check the neck relief. Very flat, but it's got some relief, it's good. Silly, just on 1.5, and that's 1.2, roughly where it should be now. The only thing about this guitar that I would change if I perhaps could, and maybe I can, I'm going to look at this right this minute, hold tight everybody, is the alignment is fractionally off. It was earlier on when we first got it. So I'm going to look at making an adjustment now, um, which, which, is, which you can do because it's a bolt-on neck, you see, thankfully. Um, so I'm going to Slack off these here uh, boats. Um, see, you know what? I don't really need to do anything else, but let's have a look. I want to 
push that in as close as we can get. Close as we can get. Close as we can get. So it's really a push down on here. <laughs> right down the middle. Let's give that a, a hand crank just to make sure it's done up. Thank you and thank you. And then all I would do with this at this point would be to stretch the strings out. Um, yeah, Stretch out the strings. And this is always a great part, an important part of the process to get this done. And this way, along with the tusk nut, this will make sure that everything stays in tune. Um, two things, remember, 50% each. If you just keep that in mind, 50% is this process here, stretching out your strings um, each time you change them. Um, and 50% is the conditional quality of your nut and the slots. So you want to do this several times because you can see that the bass strings hold a lot of slack somewhere in the mix. And uh, if you get, oh, sorry, get all of that stretched out like this, um, pressing between th thumb and forefinger lets you put quite a lot of pressure on it without too much risk of busting the strings, the thinner ones, but I tend to get a little bit scared as I get up here because it's a whole set of strings if I get that pressure wrong okay There we have it. Oh yeah. I suppose we should just briefly put it through the thing. Uh, I've got a bad feeling. We're short, short of a strap in here. What's going on? Oh, there's one. Ah. That's good. Let's borrow this. So I'm just going to do a quick sound test, not, not anything clever, um, just to make sure the various things work. There we have it, the refurbished Hondo 2. Uh, still want to put the truss rod cover in on in a minute. I think, if you recall, this is the most relief it's going to get, unless you put heavier gauge strings on. Um, but we'll start with nines because actually I think this is enough relief to be working. <laughs> mm -mm -mm.
always the pickups, uh, the plectrums I don't like kicking around. All the free ones, hate them. you can Do that'll do. Right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Long video got to be compiled later on. So let us just complete the deal with um, with putting the that thing back on. <coughs> Trust rod cover. Finishing things off. What I will do is I will supply a. Uh, Morris decal because I know that um, Dave can do the the what's that thing called? Oh, you know what we need to do? We need to fill this and redrill this because this is worn out. I forgot this one. It's not, nothing worse than your truss rod cover coming out when you don't want it to. Well, a bit fiddly, but let's do it because it's the right thing to do. And then we'll be done. So. Mm. Cutters, cutters, cutters. Who was that? That was uh, Echo and the Bunny Man. Oh my God, that was a long time ago. I'll tell you what song I do love of theirs. Blue under Blue Moon is it? Da -da 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 -da. Killing Moon under Blue Moon. Killing Moon wasn't it? The Killing Moon. Yeah. Great track. Be a great one to play live. Eh, this is going to be a bit of a, a fart around. Because we've got to get in here. Bugger. Eh, oh well. Better to get this on proper and get access to the who else than not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Da -da 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 -da. 
It's not a very good hammer, I have to say. The killing room. I remember I hadn't heard that for years and years, and we were down in Foy, which is down in the Cornwall's Cornish coast, south coast, somewhere down there. Not far from here, actually, but we were down in Foy, and um, uh, it was, was it a band playing? Or maybe it wasn't a band, but it was a it was a disco at some, it was a summer's evening and everybody, the place was full of tourists all hanging out and enjoying sort of summer evening beers by the water and evening meals and whatever. And uh, coming out of this pub was this great big anthemic um, Echo and the Bunnyman song. And was, we had to go and I was, I was just so disappointed because I not only would have liked to have stayed there and listened to it, but I wanted to play it as well. I to go back and make my band at the time play it. But they wouldn't have done it. They would have said, no, nah, not playing that. Hey, he's rubbish. Now with this, um, his, his tiny little screws, we'll need the smallest possible drill bit really just to get this to bite and the tiniest little bite into the wood yeah great track though i loved it and it reminded me it did remind me of my some of my misspent 80s youth and i used to me and a mate called callum used to hang out a lot in London when I was a a cool dude and um, very suave young fellow with very trendy long hair and stuff that's what did for my hair having it so long when I was in my 20s anyway but we used to uh, hang out and go clubbing and stuff and uh, he was a, a total Bunnyman fan, and uh, I never sort of got it really at the time. I, I liked a couple of their songs only because I heard it so often. Mainly because he played it to death. Um, but like I said, many a time, um, I was deeply uncool. You know, I, I got into things many years too late, years after everybody, all the cool kids <laughs> had got into things. Um, but at the time, everyone else was being well, moody and cool at school. I was, you know, I was the kid who liked all the wrong things <laughs> in all the wrong order. So anyway, what the hell? I like it all now, which is a funny place to be at. <laughs> Right, so that is the Hondo 2 bagged. Now what we have with the Hondo 2, I'm gonna have to do is to bag up its leftovers, bits and pieces, um, which are all here. So that's just the sort of the tail end of this. Um, and all of this obviously can go back today for to fight another day. So we have, we have, Pickups galore. Two very old, not not um, potted pickups. We have a bridge that didn't have any ret retaining clip on the uh, saddle, so they all fell out and went walkies. Yeah, so I was uh, I, I, I never got into any of the really cool things. Um, now, I had a box kicking around here a minute ago. Yeah, I couldn't get into any of the really cool things. I just I sort of I followed everything 
after the fact or I liked everything years after everyone else liked something. So I was always behind the behind the times. And I, I have to admit, at the time, it made me feel really naff, you know, because everybody's unspeakably cooler than you are. There's always you know, the, the hip kids who are, you know, they're surfing the crest of the style wave in every which way you can imagine it. And, um, and I was nowhere near that, so I was the Craven A. I wasn't into that. But I was the deeply uncool kid. But I think it was all part of also how heartless kids could be because they, they really they didn't half make make you feel um, out of place if you didn't if you didn't like all the cool stuff they let you know that you were you didn't almost didn't deserve to live <laughs> little shits right box of hondo parts a time capsule all right, there we have it. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one.